our there you go um and then <laughs> uh i also want to recognize that um this meeting is held on in unceded territory i myself i'm in squamish so i'm on squamish nation territory i'm sorry for my poor uh proper pronunciation of squamish um and then um uh, Vanessa is also on like at the SRD office. So if there was like any member of the public or um, member of this committee that would like to go in in the office, they could. So um, perfect. So we can start with uh, the agenda. You all received the agenda for this meeting. I'd like to know if any of you would like to change, add anything to the agenda. So basically, we'll be speaking about the Squamish Landfill Focus Amendment. Sue will present this illegal dumping strategy and action plan that we've done in 2022. I'll speak briefly about the Pemberton Transfer Station. We'll take a small break, and then we'll go over the studied waste and resource management plan update. Uh, and then we'll finish with a guided discussion. So... If no one has any comments, I'd like to, can someone approve? Sue Maxwell. And then up we have Andrew Tucker. Thank you. Perfect. Um, Vanessa, can you? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Um, those are the minutes from June 27, 2022 meeting. I do believe you all have you all receive it as well. So again, if you don't have any anything to change or amend, um, I'd like to get approval of the minute and support of the minute. Shannon, thank you. You might have to speak up because I I just see like some of you on the corner of my um my computer so we have shannon and then i need someone to support it thank you andrew i also wanted to note that the minutes are always going to be available on icompass on our websites for all the links and the meetings they are going to be available there uh, and archived. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, okay. So starting with the Squamish, um, so basically the, sorry, the objective of this meeting is to really, like the main objective for this one is to really get um, your support, the support of this PMAC committee for the Squamish Landfill Focus Amendment. This is the major, um, it's the main idea. Um, Shannon White at the District of Squamish needs the P, like PMAC approval for the Focus Amendment uh, engagement piece. Um, and we'll speak to that a little bit later, uh, but that's kind of like the major piece for this meeting. And then of course, uh, the PMAC meet committee is really looking at making sure that we are on track with the solid waste and resource management plan that we keep working on what's important, the focus on this committee and uh, making sure that the regional district and its member municipalities are on track of achieving and um, making progress on those actions that we committed um, back in 2016. So first, uh, first step, so we have um, the Squamish Landfill um, Focus Amendment. So I will let Shannon uh, share. You can share your screen, right, Shannon? Yeah, I just tried. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. Sorry. Again, try again. Great. Oh, yeah, there we go. So basically, Shannon will present um, a quick update on the focus amendment and the, really the engagement report. Um, 
this is something that we've done together as the, the SRD is the um, is the representative for the solid waste management plan. And it's part of the focus amendment to allow uh, the district of Squamish to take the steps towards the landfill expansion. So I'll let you Shannon present what we've done. Great, thanks. Um, so apologies, I'm like reading this really long title on my screen. <laughs> Um, can you see my screen? Just a quick nod. Okay, great. Uh, so um, my name is Shannon. I'm with the District of Squamish, as Mary Lou um, presented. I'm uh, presenting from and the District of Squamish is on the unceded traditional territory of the Squamish Nation. Um, and today I am here to particularly, but I love these meetings also, um, talk about this focused amendment. And as Mary Lou mentioned, this, this, this component that I'm talking about today is, is one piece of the landfill expansion. So I'm gonna to touch on a few of the others, but the majority of my presentation will be on the focus amendment. So just, if you have questions about the other elements, please bring them up. There's, I've, there's no, I've given space at the end to just open up for a discussion. So without further ado, just for the folks who aren't based in Squamish and don't talk about this all the time like I do, um, on your screens are on the left is the picture of the Squamish landfill present day. And then on the right is the purple square is where the landfill expansion is being proposed. Uh, we are, um, the blue is the full footprint of the site. So there's a buffer zone, there will be a berm, um, and then we will have a leachate treatment, leachate pretreatment system, uh, as well as updating or upgrading our landfill gas collection system and really upgrading our transfer site in general. The transfer site you see on the left photo is all those green bins was really built for a town of, you know, 15,000 people maybe, and now we're at almost 25,000. So it's, it's a tight space. So um, it's a lot of different pieces would be added to this project. Um, this is something I presented in the past, but I just wanted to bring highlight again, looking at project from kind of high level over the timeline. Our current landfill is on track to be full by the end of 2028, early 2029. And so um, there are many steps in this project, as I mentioned. So we are in the process of acquiring the land from the Crown. Uh, we don't anticipate acquiring it or, until um, 2025, hopefully, maybe earlier, but probably 2025. We're also conducting an archaeological impact assessment. Um, it, will, it will happen in December, but if there's snow on the ground, we'll have to bump it to 2023. Um, as well as so the SLRD amendment that we're talking about today, uh, concept design, including a traffic assessment. Um, and then we, we have done a debris flow risk assessment. Uh, we've done phase one, and that uh, resulted in a few tweaks to the concept design. Uh, potentially, there could be a phase two of that, but right now we're staying with phase one. And then we'll also be doing an environmental assessment. Um, ideally, we'll have consultants on track in the next month, but um, it, it could be a year-long process. Uh, and then we'll move into some provincial pieces, so operating our certificate, operational certificate, and the design operation closure plan. And then ideally, construction will begin in 2025 when we acquire the land. Um, but there's a lot of things that could push this timeline uh, back. So uh, I would say to the end of 2023, we're fairly sure, and then stay tuned. Um, and so this is a little bit more detail. The bottom pieces are the part I just walked through, but the top part um, is the focused amendment piece. And so as Marilyn mentioned today, um, we've, I, we've been talking about this for the past year, but today we really need to like get feedback from the PMAC on what you hear from your kind of who you represent and uh, ideally move towards general consensus that approves the report or doesn't, and then I take it back and we, we work on that element. And then the SLRD board will submit it um, to the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change in January, February, and then it could take the Ministry of Environment up to a year to approve this, this amendment. Um, and one thing like 
is that it's, it has to be really clear, like we are not changing anything else in that giant solid waste management plan. It's purely just um, one focused amendment that we are bringing forward. So there's a little bit of repetition and I apologize for that in this. Um, and I also am looking at my other screen, I just realized not the camera. So if you're looking at the camera, sorry. Um, so as I said, early 2022, we sent out a draft engagement plan that we put together about, you know, who are we going to talk to and what are we, what are some of the concerns that we think folks might have and what are the tactics we're going to roll out. Um, and we presented it to this advisory committee. And then from May to September, we, um, we did like the engagement was open. So uh, the PMAC had the opportunity to provide input uh, through the same methods that the public had and state general stakeholders. So uh, you, there was like email or website or a variety of different methods. And then in November, early November, um, Vanessa did send out uh, on behalf of the SLRD, uh, like what we heard engagement report, which was um, the District of Squamish uh, retained Eco Inspire to write. Um, and we were hoping to give you a bit of time in advance to take a look at that document and see if you had any questions or concerns and um, that you'd be able to bring them to this meeting. I'm gonna to touch on a little bit, but the document's quite comprehensive. So um, yeah. And then again, today is the meeting about uh, whether we will recommend the amendment to the SLRD board. So Vanessa did include this um, wording about the PMAC role as per our terms of reference in the email that was sent on November 3rd. And I just wanted to kind of bring them forward is that we are encouraged to work collaboratively and be committed to reaching consensus where possible. Things have to be on general consensus um, to recommend something to the SLRD board. And that ideally we're looking to move this towards the Ministry of Environment but this is also opportunity for any disagreements or concerns to be expressed. So please don't hold back if you have concerns. We, this is the time for us to, to answer them or, or, or move forward with it. So as a, just a, I'm not gonna read this entire slide, um, but just as a, like a refresher, when I say it's a focus amendment of one tiny part of this giant document, this, the blue pieces are what's changing. So on, page 35, section 15.2, there is some wording around landfill capacity and what waste management facilities exist in, in the regional district. And so the district of Squamish um, point 1A, which is on the left-hand side, which is in the blue, um, the wording there was too vague for the province to have confidence in this district of Squamish moving forward with a lateral landfill expansion. And so what we did is through this focus amendment, we are proposing, we, we remove that 1A on the left-hand side and move forward with the revision that is proposed. So it's very short and sweet. It's just saying we have evaluated some options and we're gonna move forward with expanding this commercial landfill laterally to the east. And then we would like to add section D, which is that basically says, if we are unable to move forward with the lateral expansion, we will move forward with waste export out of the region. Because if we cannot move forward with the lateral landfill expansion, we will come across, when we come to 2028, District of Squamish will have nowhere to put our garbage. I, I should say District of Squamish, Squamish Nation and Electoral Area D uh, in the SLRD will have nowhere to put their garbage. It's a concern for all of us. So. Um, this D is our backup in case, in case something comes up that we cannot overcome. Um, and if we do, do not add D, I should add, and for some reason we're, in, you know, in three years time, there is, we cannot move forward with lateral expansion. The SLRD and the District of Squamish will have to redo this entire process that we've been bringing you along so that we can add D because at this point in time, the District of Squamish is not allowed to export our waste like Whistler out of the region. We don't have that permission um, by this guiding document. So um, we're just putting this in as a backup just in case. Um, and if uh, I can add, yes, on, yes, like yes. in case of emergency, like it's always good to, even if it's not something that we look forward to, like we don't see it as a final option to just truck or waste away. But let's say there's an emergency, and we've seen that in, like in the south of the region quite often. 
there's a major amount of ways being finding a home and like if we were to send it to the Squamish landfill right now it would probably reach capacity in 2025 instead of 2028 so having this option of being able to um export the waste will just be like a good backup to have in terms of in case of emergency as well yeah. thank so, you Mary Lou. um and i should say while i'm presenting mary lou has been along with the, the, the entire journey of this so um she will also be handling any questions <laughs> thanks mary lou uh, so the draft report is the one that uh, got sent out. Uh, as I said, it's comprehensive, so this is just uh, a few highlights. But um, the report is, you might think it's kind of like um, structured in an odd way, or there might be terms that uh, don't, you kind of like, what does this mean? But uh, we were, we are required to follow uh, the Ministry of Environment's Guide to Solid Waste Management Planning. And so they have an outline of how they want their reports to look. And so this is more or less following it. And and Sue is the, the face behind Eco Inspire. So please, Sue, if there's a part where I, I don't want to misrepresent your report, so please uh, feel free also to jump in. Um, so overall, like it talks about what type of engagement we did, the strategies used to promote those engagements how many people participate in them, key themes and details of the feedback we heard. Almost everyone's comments are included in the document, either in appendix or in the general comment section. I say almost because there were times when Mary Lou and I at the pop-up booths were talking to a ton of people and we wrote the comments down, but there's always a chance maybe we didn't catch, you know, one, one comment. Um, but yeah, so all the comments from social media, online platforms, in person, uh, and then also an overview of Indigenous consultation um, and then discussions around the proximity to an aerodrome, which is the airport in Squamish. It's actually not a real airport. It's only an aerodrome. I learned that. Uh, as well as it, the document also includes like the engagement plan, the original one, and, and all the information packages that were distributed. Um, the an overview of some of like the tactics that we implemented between May and September. It's it was hard to list everything, so apologies. But basically, we did pop up booths. Um, we had comment cards at the land Swamish landfill, SLRD, and District of Swamish offices. There was a giant like six foot sign at at the Swamish landfill. We installed. We sent letters to neighboring properties um within 1500 meters of the site we directly engaged with the airport executive and transport canada uh five letter referral letters were sent to first nations um by the slrd there was a lot of social media posts um and then direct engagement with squamish nation um and then we also did like an online open house evening for folks who might not be near squamish that want to attend um and then uh, there was an online platform called Let's Talk Squamish ads, uh, as I mentioned, and then the SLRD's website directed people to Squamish because because this technically is the SLRD's amendment. So there was a lot of collaboration in um, the communication uh, channels. Um, and so I have a few examples. So the Let's Talk Squamish page is on the left. So those are some of the comments that we saw. There's an SLRD uh, Facebook post in the middle and then ads um, about, you know, some of the pop-ups that people could attend as well as a deadline for feedback um, that we, we rolled out the two weeks before the, the feedback time period closed just to have it. I should add, um, while a lot of the in-person work focus of this engagement was done in the Southern part of the region, we did try to connect with and inform folks in the northern part of the region um, because we're so spread out you know there might not be that much interest in what happens with the squamish landfill if for folks who live in goldbridge or or um lillouette and that's okay i'm not my feelings are not hurt i understand but we wanted to provide opportunities so that we did advertising in the um uh, Goldbridge newspaper, I believe it. Sorry, I think I wrote it down. Anyway, we put it in the newspaper in the northern part. 
Uh, and then that's why we had some online webinars and stuff as well, just to try that, to get, have that opportunity for folks. So even though I just walked through a ton of different opportunities for people to engage, what we actually received was very limited engagement, uh, which is uh, a shame. Um, and so we, generally there was support for proposed amendments. So, you know, people had questions and lots of questions, which I'm gonna chat about in a sec. Um, but the real main other thing that people asked about or commented on was folk waste to energy, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. And then we did receive two comments against the lateral, lateral landfill expansion in, in all of the comments. Um, and those both comments said, we don't support this. We think that the District of Swarma should look into waste to energy instead. Um, and then someone said, we should not export our waste. We should prefer waste reduction. So really, I should note that that was in the total of four months of engagement. Those, those kind of two bottom bullet point or that bottom bullet point is the only kind of negative against the project that we heard. Um, and Ultimately, the waste to energy questions we had to, we cannot pursue waste to energy at this point in time due to timing largely, um, as well as the District of Squamish Council does not currently support waste to energy um, and cost considerations. Um, and so, and timing is important because our landfill is, is, we are so close to reaching capacity that um, getting all the levels of approval for waste to energy and then construction, it, it's not feasible within the, like the time that we have. So um, that honestly is one of the largest things against it. Um, I should note that in the current SLRD solid waste management plan, it also does not support it, but that being said, we can always amend it. So what we did it, when we were talking to folks about waste to energy is we really said, you know, like, look, technology is changing. Uh, there's a lot of things that would need to be overcome to move towards that direction, but we should definitely have that discussion when there's the full update to the solid waste management plan. Um, that's like a more appropriate place to, to really look at it because it's a regional solution. It's not going to be feasible for just the District of Squamish to implement. So um, I apologize, Mary Lou and Vanessa, but we, I gave them uh, your email addresses. <laughs> And told them to join up for the update committee. <laughs> so, um, and that's like what we should, the appropriate uh, path for the waste energy piece. Um, this slide full of text is really the key themes that we heard. So a lot of people ask about process. So like, what does that look like? What's the next steps? Why, why is the Ministry of Environment involved? Like, because we were literally at the Britannia Beach playground, just chatting with residents. So you had people who were just had never heard, they don't talk solid waste. So they really wanted to hear kind of what was happening. A lot of folks were interested in the options, like why, why is an expansion needed? Um, you know, no perfect solution. What are the other options? What if the province says no? Um, and then also location. These are the, so these are the key themes where like some people are like, where is the landfill? <laughs> <laughs> who owns the land? Like there was all these pieces around it um, and some questions about the waste from Whistler as well. And then we moved into environmental impact. So a lot of folks were concerned about environment, which is fantastic. So asked about environmental impact assessments, um, bear management. Uh, there was some concerns about birds, uh, gas, landfill gas collection and leachate. Uh, and then flooding, there was actually in particular um, some neighboring properties that were concerned about flooding. And um, like as we build a new landfill, perhaps it could cause water to pool in neighboring properties, um, which is, I'm really glad they brought that up. Um, and then lifespan, some questions around like how long is the current landfill gonna last? And then waste reduction and improving the transfer station. So we got a lot of feedback on what people don't like about our current transfer station, which is great um, to hear, and hopefully we can address in the in the the revamp of the site. Um, and and this was really important. We had we we really tried to emphasize that the district of Squamish is really focused on waste reduction and waste diversion. However, ultimately we do need a disposal site. We can't just say we're going to close our landfill and that's that. Um, that would be lovely. Maybe I wouldn't have a job, but. They, um, 
we there was you know a lot of discussion around that just saying okay well this is important and ideally the more we divert the longer this piece of infrastructure will last the community right um and then people asking about costs so in response to a lot of these questions again this is quite a lot of text and this goes against all of my powerpoint best practices i apologize but I just wanted to pull some of the key things that we were telling folks in response to those, some of those key themes. I didn't include all of them, but, and I'm not gonna go through them because I've already talked about the waste to energy piece and then the environmental impact. There's a lot that we're doing. So as I mentioned, we're going to do an environmental impact assessment. We're also committed to increasing bird mitigation and deterrence strategies, which goes hand in hand with the airport piece. And we also are doing a, a debris flow risk assessment that's, that addresses the flooding. And then waste reduction is always key on top of mind. So updating our transfer station to make it much more easy to use and user friendly. Um, and then cost. So right now the cost is around $49, $50 million. That is the entire uh, life cycle of the site or lifespan. So like literally from like last year until the site closes, so that includes closure costs. Um, don't hold me to $50 million because as we've seen in the past few years, construction costs have increased incredibly. So, um, you know, but this is what we're working with best, best information at this point in time. So hi, just to bring it back to where we are today. So this is the, talking about the PMAC and the focus amendment timeline. So we're sitting right now at the um, last week of November, and which is the committee meeting today. And then we will be sharing the report. First, I wanted to run it by this committee before we then go out to the public and say, this is what we heard, just in case there's something we've missed or a big red flag that we need to address. And then ideally it goes to the province in early 2023. So without further ado, what I'm gonna do is open up for discussion, questions, comments, but I am gonna actually pass it to Mary Lou and Vanessa to facilitate uh, because this is technically uh, their amendment. Yes. So thank you, Shannon. Thank you for, um, that was a really comprehensive presentation for something that was quite broad um, and took quite a bit of time. Um, so I don't know if you wanna, close your presentation so we can have a good um, view of everyone. Um, welcome, Tom. <laughs> um, so yeah, basically, um, this is when, and this is a right place to ask questions, uh, make your comments. And because um, after that, when we get consensus, and it goes to the regional district board, then it's basically we're saying this committee approve uh, this engagement piece and this is what we're gonna send, we want to send to the province. So this is really the right place. If you have any questions, I open it to you guys. Yes, Sue. Hi. Hi, thanks. So um, when I read through, I had a couple of comments directly on one of the tables. Is that all right? Um, yes. So it's the table, let me see here, uh, table five, responses to feedback on page 13. And uh, I was just wondering, well, so um, in the environmental impacts, um, the list that's there, um, includes wildlife and, and various things, but it missed salmon and salmon was in the first table. And I think it's very important to include that because of the proximity to the river. And then I was wondering lower down in that same section where it says to work with an external qualified environmental professional. Um, and I was wondering if we could add on to that phrase just to make it clear that this working with the environmental professional is around making or ensuring protection for wildlife and salmon. Again, I don't think people necessarily recognize what a qualified environmental professional does. It's a fairly new term in the province for anybody who's not doing um, referral work. Um, 
So yeah, that was just, I mean, I know they're minor on the one hand, but in terms of really understanding, um, you know, the environmental piece and making it clear so that when this document goes forward, that those things are captured. And I was wondering if there is a specific commitment around, I mean, I'm assuming the Squamish landfill has an electric fence, but is there a commitment to um, continue that around the expansion? Yeah, I can um, jump in. I just, Sue, uh, okay, to answer your second question, or second point is yes, um, the by the landfill criteria, which is a provincial guidance document for landfills, um, we have to have a wildlife fence. And so all new landfill, I was pretty sure that was true. I just yeah. wanted to yeah, double check. Okay. And then, sorry, for, for I just want to make sure that we catch when you say we want to include salmon in table five and under environmental impact. Is there a specific wording or like, how would you like, how, what are you thinking about phrasing? Oh, I just in the list um, where it says, hey, I gotta put my glasses on to read it again. <laughs> Uh, it says comments and questions reflect the concern for the environment that respondents had, including management for wildlife leachate gas and all of that. I would just say wildlife salmon leachate gas, like just add it into the list so it doesn't get lost. Great, thank it you. Was in the previous table, right? And then when I came to this table, I'm like, wait a minute, there's no salmon. And again, being such an important um, feature of our uh, regional district, it should be there. And, sorry, and maybe if I could add on to what you're saying there, Sue, it might, it might be worthwhile to just sort of, with specific attention, sort of put toward mitigating any effects of leachate um, into water courses, because that's sort of the, the most associated sort of um, negative effect on, on salmon. Yes, thank you. Great. Right. Uh, we can definitely include that. And the did you, Sue, did you also want a bullet point addressing salmon or just including them in that paragraph top? Uh, bit? If it, it depends what everyone else thinks, but I just don't want to see that lost out of this version of, the, you know, this second table. It was in the first one. So um, if folks want to have it explicitly as a as a bullet, I would certainly wouldn't object to that. But again, just making sure it's really consistent. This is great. Um, thank you. We can, uh, so, sorry, I'm, Mary Lou, I don't know how we, we've never done that, I've never done this before, but we can include all the changes that you've mentioned. Yes, yes. and it's recorded, so we'll be able to go back and listen to it, that's great, and I'm also taking notes to make sure that we're not, um, yeah, that we capture everything. Um, if you need to, you can just ask as well. I can just email you uh, what I've got because I have a annotated version. Yeah, and we'll definitely, as usual, send the minutes. Um, and Vanessa will certainly reach out to you guys to kind of like ask, make sure that she, we're not forgetting anything important that you mentioned. Um, so that will be part of the process as well. And um, yeah, we can, we'll, and then Shannon will go back and make sure to amend and add all the comments. Um, do you want to add anything else, Sue? Uh, yes, actually. So in the previous table, um, birds got missed. That was the other thing when I, so I was focusing on the, that second table thing. I'm going to figure out which one it is. Um, I think it's table four. Under the wildlife impacts, there must have been questions about birds in the airport because it shows up in the other table. Yeah, um, I can jump in on that. Actually, no one brought it up from my memory. Um, and we did co consolidate. So Sue built this report off of all our written comments. Okay. So I don't think anybody asked us about birds, but bird is on a key part of landfill management. So that's why it's in like the strategy table. Not to get I like nitpicky on it, but that's why it's in the like we have committed to bird deterrence because it's important, even if nobody asks us for it. So um, okay. yeah, so that table four is really like the questions we heard. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Okay, um, Laurie. Just to further sue there, would marine life capture more than salmon? Would that be better wording, Sue, or do you prefer naming salmon? 
would have to be salmon and marine life. Mm. Salmon needs to be explicitly in the report. Great. Um, and then I just have a comment comment about the the one thing I did notice was how little community engagement there was and how many times you guys tried for community engagement. Um, but what is on there is is pretty diverse and pretty good representation, I feel, of maybe if there had been hundreds of people, the things they all would have said. So um, although there's very few, I think it's a good representation of, of questions and, and concerns. And then my other question, um, Shannon and Mary Lou, is I see there what was done with the First Nations. I wondered what the outcomes were with the First Nations. So um, we only heard, so there's been ongoing uh, engagement with Squamish Nation, even before this focused amendment started. This, fo as it mentioned, focused amendment's one piece. So um, Squamish Nation has been engaged since I think it was 2020, I wanna say at this point. Um, and so we, um, so we did not hear from any other uh, First Nations. Really, I look. I, that's that's. Uh, so nothing was there. And then Squamish Nation, we had um, in in person kind of meetings, uh, in person meeting, and then emails updates as well. So um, the I would say the out. Oh, there was no specific outcome on this focused amendment specific, but there have been pieces that have come up that impacted the rest of the project. So like the archeological impact assessment has come through that dialogue and engagement, um, but it's not a component of the focused amendment, if that makes sense. So, so there's yeah. no support for or against, it's just, they know about yeah. it. This, no, 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 so, excuse me. So the, I over, misspoke there. So the Squamish Nation has um, provided uh, conditional um, support for this project. So this has gone through Squamish Nation. Yeah, yeah uh, it's a key part of that thing, of this, like, not of that thing, of this entire project, to be honest. Mm. Yeah, and if I could just add on to what you're uh, mentioning, Shannon, this is um, Rachel here for the Squamish Nation. Um, you know, up outside of this amendment, uh, then we expect that we'll sort of be continually consulted um, on the project moving forward. So uh, we know that we can we can work together to sort of oversee it in the best way possible. And as you mentioned, Shannon, um, we've yeah already had some comments from our archaeology manager and um, and other staff just to um, yeah just knowing that we're gonna continue to comment as it like the next phases come through in the coming years. Exactly. Thanks, Rachel. That's perfect because this this you this group might not hear that much about this project once this this focus amendment piece is done. I'll, I'll continue to give little updates, but a lot of it's just like kind of like these different pieces that we'll be working on. So um, yeah, we'll be working directly with Squamish Nation, but probably not this committee as a whole all the time. Yeah. Thanks, Shannon. And um, we haven't heard from other. Um, First Nation communities, but for sure, if we were to receive any comments, sometimes it's just like they don't have the staff or the time uh, to provide comments in the time, like in the time that we have, uh, but we'll, we'll never like avoid any of those comments, like everything that I'll be receiving within the next, I don't know, five, six years of the project, I will for sure be working with Shannon on that. Uh, it's just that for now we haven't received any um, any comments, but we um, we work with the Minister of Environment to make sure that we were engaging First Nation um, enough, and uh, we engaged a little bit more than what we were required, uh, just because we knew that at, at some point some First Nation could be using uh, the Squamish landfill, even if they're not right now. So um, I think we did okay with the engagement with First Nation communities. It's just that we haven't received um, any feedback so far. Uh, do we have any more questions or comments? I don't see any hands. 
am I understanding that we can, um, so apologize, I haven't done it before. So it's not quite like, I don't know if we should go around table and like specifically vote. We, as for the role of the payback, we need general consensus. Um, so I don't want to put anyone on the spot either, but I think what I'll do is just go around and get your um, personal feedback one by one. I'll go, uh, I'll use my screen to reach out to you guys. So with that, we're making sure that we do get general consensus uh, for, for everyone. Shannon, yes. Um, I just want to jump in. So um, just to clarify, so it's general consensus. We will include, like, I just don't want, we don't have to vote again after you see the changes to the document. So it will include um, the, sa like, salmon will be explicit in the, in table five, in the environmental impact. Um, and there will be a, a bullet point around mitigation to impacts of leachate in water course. And then we'll further define the QEP definition. Um, those are the three bullet points I've got for to add. So that's what that's what we're doing a general consensus on. I would say like salmon and marine life to make sure we represent Laurie's comment. Uh, so I'm just looking at the chat. Um, so Laura, oh yeah, Laurie, you're proposing a, a poll, Vanessa. I'm relying on you. Can we do a poll for that? <laughs> or we... I could, but can I make a suggestion? Why don't we say, do you recommend that we recommend this report to the SRD board to be um, brought forward to the MOE? And then everybody can say yes, and we can move on. What? Um... Sue has her hand lifted. Yeah. Why wouldn't we just have a motion of the board to accept it? and put it forward. So yeah, so basically right now I need consensus from PMAC committee to bring it to the regional district board. So then we can get from the regional district board a um, an approval to bring it to, to send it to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change so that's kind of like the step-by-step -step process. So this committee is right now vote, vote, voting on consensus to uh, for Shannon and I to bring it to the board of director to request for a decision. So um, <laughs> thumbs up from Claire, thumbs up from Denise. We have Misha. Um, Misha, do you have a question? Or was it just approval? Just approval. Okay, perfect. Approval from Misha, Shannon, um, Carmen, yes, Laurie. Uh, oh my God, you're changing, like you're changing on my screen, so it's hard. Tom, we have approval. Denise, we already do. Perfect. Uh, Vanessa, can you keep track of that? <laughs> <laughs> it was a little bit of a gun show. I'm so sorry, guys. I guess I should have been a little bit more prepared for that round. Um, so from could, my understanding, everyone is agreeing in agreement, correct? No one is in disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's that's perfect. So um, in January, I will write a request for decision report to the regional district board and uh, we will ask them to support the uh, the engagement piece and will be uh, the next step will be to send it to the Minister of Environment so um, we'll for sure keep you posted. Uh, sorry I'm receiving an input um, uh, Vanessa, can you just give me a sec, guys? Um, okay. Uh, we have a we have a a comment from Denise, and I'm sorry, I must it must be because I'm French, but I don't understand your comment, Denise. <laughs> 
I'm so sorry. I, Vanessa, or Mary Lou, sorry, I thought she'd just jump in. Uh, Denise is on the phone. She, so basically now she's recommending that you ask, does anyone not agree to, to do it? Like just basically we just did the consensus, but just in case someone got missed, give them the chance to raise their hand. Thank you. No problem. I'm, I'm, I'm learning new, new words right now. Um, so uh, do I have anyone that opposed to, um, to the report to the board. I don't see any hands, so we're gonna, gonna take it as a general consensus. Thank you very much. And my apology for uh, this being a little bit hectic. Um, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, we are on time, which is great. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, next, uh, next subject, it's the illegal dumping strategy and action plan. So basically the SRD in 2022, um, we hired Sue Maxwell from Eco Inspire to do an illegal dumping strategy and action plans. We really wanted to understand, um, kind of the barriers and what could be done kind of the next step to bring the regional district and member municipalities in a better place in terms of illegal dumping. So I will let Sue present what she um, what she provided to us. It was really well received at the board. Uh, everyone was super enthusiastic with what Sue presented and the new act, the, the actions that are required. So um, yeah, it was it was great, and it's a it's a great report, and I'm looking forward for 2023 to be able to take uh, actions on that. So, um, Sue, do you have the capacity of sharing your screen? I think so. Let me just give it a go here. Do you see yes. the right thing? Okay, <laughs> you never know exactly what people will see. Um, yeah, so this was a great project to work on, um, and uh, essentially, I'll just kind of go through a little bit about the context, the process we followed, what the impacts are, what, where, and why, some roles, as well as then what the strategies and actions uh, that came out of it, and the implementation. So uh, the definition of illegal dumping, we use the one that um, the Indigenous Zero Waste Technical Advisory Group uses. Uh, deliberately abandoned or dumped waste at an unauthorized location. And we didn't include litter, although in our conversations with people, litter came up. So we did um, incorporate some of that feedback, but we were really focusing on, focusing on the uh, larger amounts of material that people, people were purposefully dumping. Um, and this picture here is from the Northern part of the SLRD from a ticket guardian. So um, obviously there are several provincial acts that already show that illegal dumping is illegal. Um, Environmental Management Act, the Land Act, the Forest and Range Practices Act, as well as it's a component of some others. It's also included in some of the SLRD bylaws for waste facilities and similarly in um, bylaws that Whistler and Squamish have, but there's not a specific SLRD bylaw that just looks at illegal dumping. Currently, there's no formal process within um, the SLRD for illegal dumping or a designated budget, which means each complaint needs to be handled on a uh, one individual basis. Uh, the SLRD does have a web page dedicated to what should be done, um, has supported cleanups, has provided signage, um, has obviously providing disposal options, um, and there is a bylaw officer. There's also the provincial uh, wrap line, report all polluters and poachers, that goes, um, the information then gets fed from there to the conservation officer service and the natural resource officers. Um, and it's not a problem just in the SLRD, it's right across BC. And it's not um, fully the SLRD's responsible, uh, responsibility, nor any other particular party. It's, it's really everybody has little pieces of it. The other parties have resources to help address it as well, but those are limited. 
So what we did was take a look at the best practices in the literature, we surveyed other regional districts, and we did interviews with the key ones that are really doing a lot of actions on it. We interviewed over 30 local organizations, and thank you to many of you who are on this call today for participating in that. And then for the other ones that we couldn't either reach or who had been recommended through those interviews, we surveyed another um, over 50 local organizations. And when we did the survey, we found um, that people identified uh, their concerns with illegal dumping as polluting the environment, uh, leading to more illegal dumping, uh, harm to wildlife, spreading invasive species, the fire risk, it's unsightly, and then it can harm uh, the tourism and, rec tourism and recreation aspects, but also spoiling the outdoor experience for people. Um, and almost nobody said that it was not a concern. The kinds of materials that people would see when they're out are material uh, mattresses and box springs, yard waste, furniture, uh, construction and demolition, and then there was special mention of drywall, household mixed waste, so like bags of garbage, um, as well as entire vehicles, campers, trailers, uh, large appliances, tires, metal, pallets, uh, electronics, as well as sometimes gravel and fill. And then we also asked people to pinpoint like where they were seeing the problems. Um, and we mapped this out, but what we found in general was that it needed to be accessible. Nobody was going too far up a road to do it. You're not finding it way off in the middle of the Duffy. Uh, so generally not far away from a main highway or road, but also people didn't want to be seen to be doing it. So it was generally um, screened a bit, uh, or sometimes there was locations where historically a community might have dumped material, or it was known to be an illegal dumping spot and um, people would continue to dump there. And then there was also some that was associated with um, uh, camping or squatting uh, at some locations. So here's just a few more little pictures of, of where it was, but essentially everywhere that's easy to get to and slightly hidden. And um, why? There was a particular thing around yard waste. Um, everybody seemed to know that putting a mattress out on, the, uh, on a back road was wrong, but yard waste, sometimes people would feel like, oh, you know, it's, you know, it's bits of nature, it's going to compost. They didn't see that that would be as big a problem. Um, but there also might be a lack of knowledge of options. So sometimes if you're dumping tires, you know, there are a bunch of options where it could be free to drop off a tire somewhere. And sometimes people were driving further than that option to uh, uh, dump it illegally. So it might be a lack of knowledge of the options, convenience. Cost um, was one that came up, but obviously we weren't interviewing the people who were illegally dumping uh, directly. So it's hard to tell. But what we were also thinking is that it might be that what we heard was that it was not a direct long-term link. And so sometimes if a fee was raised for something, people might see a spike in illegal dumping at that time, but not in the long term. And we also saw in interviewing other regional districts that of the few that remain that don't have any tipping fees, they would still sometimes see illegal dumping there as well. And so part of what we were also hearing is sometimes it might be around capacity. People who are illegally dumping may not may not have a home, they may be experiencing challenges with um, uh, mental health or substance use. And so I think sometimes the thought about cost might be more that people who are experiencing those challenges are often not wealthy people either. Um, and so there's often a, a link there with your ability to afford things. In terms of why not, we uh, obviously people were saying, well, obviously we care about the environment, it's the right thing, we respect our community, um, you know, we want a nice place to live. Uh, so there was lots of good messaging there that could be used for things in the future. And when we took a look at roles, and these are just sort of a sampling of some of the types of organizations that we interviewed, um, we heard that First Nations were cleaning up things within their own uh, direct reserves, but also in their broader territories. Some were interested or already had guardian programs. Uh, BC Parks would uh, collect things within the parks or sometimes on the routes to parks. Um, the natural resource, resource officers and the conservation officers would also clean up things, although they had to prioritize things based on, you know, is this a risk to a salmon bearing stream versus is this just unsightly? Is there a risk to wildlife? 
Um, so Wild, Wild Site BC had an interest and Bays of Species Councils had an interest. Ministry of Transportation have it in their contracts for the highway maintenance crews for the parts along the highways. Uh, community groups were already organizing cleanups um, and had an interest in it. Uh, and of course, the municipalities and the regional district had an interest as well as there were citizens. Um, one awesome guy in particular that Shannon connected me with, um, you know, had already picked up over, I think, 15,000 pounds of materials um, just on his kind of daily rounds that he does all the time. So um, there was a fair amount of enthusiasm. And based on that, we developed a suite of strategies and actions. And these, I want to note, are for the coalition because what we recommend is that the SLRD um, bring together all of these different people because they all said, if there was a coalition, we would like to be part of it and we would like to help. But all of them said, we don't have the capacity to take on the whole thing, but everybody had a different piece. So just keep in mind that these actions are for the coalition as a whole. So the first thing is to make it easier to dispose of things properly. So seeing if there can be uh, uh, gaps addressed in disposal options, uh, one thing that's good is that the province has committed to rolling out uh, regulations for mattresses and box springs. So eventually there should be an extended producer responsibility program for them. So that will be helpful. And then hopefully we all need to push hard to make sure that that program offers uh, good accessible service within the SLRD. Um, so anyway, addressing those gaps in disposal, uh, promoting the free or low cost options um, for the commonly dumped materials so that people are clear that, oh, there's no need to drive it all the way <laughs> out on a road somewhere. Um, there's some, some good local options. Make it hard to uh, illegally dump. So making illegal dumping feel more visible. And I put up this picture here because it was a really good collaboration with the Pemberton Wildlife Association and the SLRD where the um, PWA did a cleanup with our, their volunteers on the Green River. And then after that, they installed cameras and these signs. And they noted that after that, there really was um, much less illegal dumping. And also because they had done that, some of the neighbors along the road were paying more attention and would contact them if they saw like, oh, I saw a truck go in full and it came back empty. And then they had the cameras and could work with the COs so that you could really target the people who were doing illegal dumping. And, and you know, the word kind of got out that it's like, oh, that, you know, don't go there. Uh, it's very visible. Controlling access to hotspots can also be a good solution. Um, concern, obviously, there's a lot of recreation interests in our regional districts. So um, people didn't want their, you know, uh, access blocked off to their favorite um, recreation spot. But um, again, with this Green River example, there was like a spur road that wasn't accessing anything particular. It was the forest companies. And so when they, uh, when the PWA talked to the forest companies, they're like, oh, we don't need that. We'll just block off either end. And then they didn't have any more illegal dumping on that particular uh, side road. Uh, also, you could consider requirements for permits uh, and businesses, and this would be more pertinent for the municipalities in terms of if you are licensing a landscaping business or a renovation or a construction or demolition business, um, you know, could you uh, um, ask for their plans in terms of what they're, how they're going to handle the materials so you can make sure those materials are actually going to uh, the proper facilities. Um, communication will be key as well. So we recommended developing a communications action plan specific to this. Uh, providing information on existing disposal options, showing how to report if somebody does see illegal dumping, uh, a real focus on highlighting the risks of dumping yard waste, uh, particularly around invasive species spread and the risk of fire, and also what people tended to see is that would often be the first material dumped, and then other people would think, oh, this is A, okay to dump stuff, and B, this is the spot to do it, <laughs> and then they would start adding other materials. So um, if uh, more people can be clear that yard waste shouldn't be dumped, then that will be helpful. Uh, targeted outreach campaigns to um, uh, maybe specific areas or for around specific materials. Uh, the SLRD already does have some um, uh, and spring and fall around uh, when you change out your tires that, hey, here's the locations to bring your tires. And also signage. And signage was um, found to be most effective when there's been a cleanup and when it's um, a community group involved with it as well that says, hey, we care about this area. We've cleaned it up. Don't bring this material back. Partnership will really be one of the key things. 
Um, so we are hoping or, or the SLRD will be coordinating a coalition. Um, and we did hear from everybody that they wanted to participate, but there's also particular work that can be done with municipalities, regional districts, the province, including um, not just regulation of EPR programs, but also for the uh, conservation officer service, the Ministry of Transportation, uh, the natural resource officers, all of those groups. Um, as well as working with EPR programs, if there's not service for certain materials, can there be collection events or other options that would allow um, uh, those materials to be collected? And we also heard when we were doing the interviews, you know, there was some community groups that are like, hey, you know, we'd love for a trail cleanup day to, you know, we could focus at a trailhead and help to cover up different areas. So uh, also facilitating cleanup, uh, dedicated SLRD support for the uh, Pemberton uh, Wildlife Association cleanup was very helpful. So can that happen on an ongoing basis? Um, can there be a protocol developed in terms of how to handle the report so that it is easy and straightforward and doesn't have to go through multiple layers of staff every time because there's already a process? Uh, waiving tipping fees for the cleanups is really helpful for um, encouraging community and volunteer involvement and supporting those local groups partnering together um, on that has been really helpful. And that's really a strength, I think, of our regional district being somewhat smaller is that we tend to know who the different organizations are, and this coalition could make that even stronger. Of course, we want to monitor, um, so developing a reporting system um, that would go through the SLRD first, because we did hear, and not just in the SLRD, it's often very hard to get the information back from the RAP line, and especially in a timely way to know like, okay, who's, is somebody cleaning it up? If so, who, when's that happening? And by having something a little more coordinated, um, that could be helpful. And then we could also track and map it to see like, okay, like the Green River example, it got cleaned up. There was a subsequent uh, issue, small issue, but it was um, followed up by the conservation officer service and now it's been fairly um, minimal. Um, tracking costs, this has been helpful and it's also good to highlight to the province, you know, this is what, what it's costing um, and not just the SLRD, but all of the organizations within the, um, within the coalition and monitor known sites. And this doesn't have to be done by the SLRD. We did hear um, from say groups like the uh, Sea to Sky um, Invasive Species Council, as well as the Lillooet one is that they often have people that are out in different areas, the NROs, the uh, parks officers, you know, all different kinds of people are out um, on, the, on the land already, um, as well as uh, um, sometimes the guardians. And so it's like, if people are already taking a look and can feed that in, then it's not like somebody else needs to go out and um, take a look all the time. And enforcement is also key. Um, we did hear from the Cowichan Valley Regional District that they had developed a, 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 a bylaw for themselves that then could be modeled by their municipalities that allowed for a very easy ticketing system that was less costly than requiring somebody to have to go to court. Um, and uh, having some dedicated support for enforcement would be helpful. Uh, working together to provide more coverage, as I mentioned, and making enforcement visible. So this is not so much to shame an individual person, so much as to say, um, you know, if somebody was fined or ticketed or, uh, you know, an incident was uh, discovered to show that there are consequences to it. So you don't necessarily need to name the person because often, um, People who do that generally things aren't going well in their lives anyway, but more to show uh, the broader public that, you know, there is a rule and there's consequences if it isn't followed. Um, and also following up on identifiable waste. Um, lots of times there's people's addresses and things in there. And um, for the people who had followed up with that, even if they weren't able to, you know, ticket or uh, find somebody, the fact that somebody uh, learned that their waste got tracked back to them. And sometimes it wasn't maybe their fault. Maybe it was somebody else they had entrusted to handle it, but they knew then that that system was failing. And then obviously they would go back and talk to um, the, the people involved with that system. Uh, but then generally you wouldn't see uh, subsequent illegal dumping by the same people. So um, uh, it would take some resources to do that. So there are existing staff to be able to work on it, but it would take another um, part, uh, half FTE to do it. And there would be specific costs, such as if there were to be um, signage or uh, the waiving of tipping fees or certain things as well. 
Uh, in the broader report, there is a time frame for it. Uh, as with any plan, it just makes sense to evaluate it to see if it's effective, what needs to change, and uh, allow then for ongoing adjustment. And so that's really, um, in, a, in a whirlwind view, that is our uh, illegal dumping strategy, but just wanting to see if anybody had any questions. We have a very quiet group today. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Uh, this is this is great. Uh, obviously, I've saw that report before, and I saw the presentation. Uh, we now have a few questions, Sue. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering: Do we have a a time frame for implementing that, or um, so creating the coalition and doing these wonderful things? So for now, it all depends on budget and staff allocation. Um, so at this point, on, until we have budget approved for extra staff allocation, I'm not sure how much of those actions we'll be able to take. Um, for sure, co coalition, I wouldn't myself be able to take that on. Um, we are looking at some of the smaller, smaller actions, let's say um, waiving tipping fees uh, protocol. Uh, currently, the protocol at the regional district is like everyone needs to fill a form. The form has to be approved by the CAO uh, and get the support from uh, mayors or elected officials. So we're, we're in 2023, we'll be looking at kind of like trying to reduce a little bit of those uh, steps and make it a little bit easier for people to do cleanup. Um, but right now, until we have, I until I have better uh, understanding of the 2023 and forward budget, I won't be able to say much about um, when we'll be able to do any of that. But there was like a lot of enthusiasm from board members for sure. Shannon, do you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, I know there's some technology, uh, like some like through the Recollect app used to have one, it like where you could report illegal dumping um with an app. Was that did you look into that at all? Like or the different technologies available? Uh we didn't go into a deep dive on the technologies, but um uh Cathet Regional District had been uh using uh, something for reporting, and um, the Cowichan Valley also had a reporting system. And so uh, uh, I think the main thing is to develop a reporting system, and then I'm assuming that technology would likely be part of it. Um, but when that happens, then um, it would make sense to talk to, I mean, all the different places, but in particularly those regional districts that have already been implementing systems, and then kind of finding out, you know, where is their state of that? Can they share it? Um, uh, and what are the pros and cons of each one? I guess for me, I guess it's tough thinking about this at a regional perspective. Like if we are all sharing an app, often the use is then, you know, your local government can send a team to go clean it up. But if the data is all going to the regional district, I guess it's just thinking it through the process. Sorry, I'm getting in the weeds. Sorry. <laughs> It's a good thing to start thinking about in terms of um, once the information gets reported, and this is something the coalition could work on, who should cover what? Like, you know, I, I'm guessing there'll be some easy things. It's in a park. Okay, great. That's parks. You know, it's along the side of the highway, you know, um, BC Hydro or uh, BC Highways. I mean, I should note BC Hydro also does some cleanup of things as well. Um, so I think it'll be, that would be like a really good thing for the coalition to discuss to say, who's got capacity for what? Um, and who has interest in what, because uh, there's the cleanup part, but there's also, um, even for the cleanups, there's a lot of community groups who are interested in helping. Sometimes the community groups also have some very good communications tools in terms of their newsletters or social media. And so many of them were happy to share the word. Um, so I think when you get the coalition together, you'll find out who has capacity for what and who wants to take on which pieces. Um, and that's also part of tracking the cost. If there's pieces that nobody is taking on, 
um, then that might be something to start saying, okay, well, we were able to cover this much, but not that much. And I think um, because illegal dumping has come up quite often that UBCM, uh, the Union of BC Municipalities and others, um, as an issue for uh, of concern from local governments to the province, then um, starting to have better tracking. And if, if everything can't be covered, then that is also another tool to be able to say to the provincial government, hey, this is the the amount that we can cover. But, um, you know, we did hear when we were talking to the conservation officer services and the NRO that, um, you know, we are quite a, uh, we have a, a lot of land in our regional district. Um, we don't have a very big population necessarily, but we have a really big visitor population. And that visitor population tends to spread all over the place. And so um, not particularly that they're illegally dumping, but that it just puts a lot more demand on the services of the COs and the NROs, which means that they can't necessarily prioritize uh, certain illegal dumping things, although they have for things where it's like, oh, it's a vehicle and it's going to be perhaps putting oil in a river or something. But um, uh, those are all things, this plan, I guess, should preface, will not magically solve the legal dumping overnight, but it's more about taking steps towards addressing it in um, a more coordinated way, as well as getting some better data that if it can't be fully addressed, that you at least have some information to, to back or stats and data to be able to use. Thanks. Right. So well, yeah, like this piece really like at the regional district level was really kind of like just the start of like how can we tackle the illegal dumping how can we all work together um so that's why and i want to i want to bring the information um we hired eco inspired through an rfp process so i just want to make sure that nobody thought that we just give directly uh the contract to um to sue um it was just like really a first step for us to see okay what what need to be done to get there to improve illegal dumping and also speak to what do we need as capacity? Do we need more money? Do we need more staff? Uh, and so we could speak and provide that information um, to the board. And this is just the very first step of many, many steps that needs to happen um, to kind of have a better, better handle on illegal dumping and again as Sue mentioned there's so many so many factors that creates and and take part of the illegal dumping and like housing capacity and mental health is or for sure two of those factors that come into um that are like greater than just this little team that we can we can work on but it's a it's a first step and uh the regional district would for sure keep you uh, keep this meeting committee uh, updated on uh, what we can do for the next steps. And um, did I, I just have a one question. Did I send, did we send a full report uh, to this member of, like member, from, like the report from Sue? I don't, I don't know if I did, but we could definitely uh, provide it to you if you were interested. Uh, Mary Lou, I think Carmen, Carmen, did you have a question? Um, not a question. I just would like a copy of the report. And I'm glad to see that some movement has been made on the illegal dumping issues from the PWA. <laughs> Yeah, it's something that was part of the solid waste management plan and um, that we never had the chance to make much progress. So we're very, very happy with that. Um, so I'm just being, being mindful of the time. So um, just a, again, if any questions before we move to the next subject. Yeah, sorry, Mary Lou, I have a quick question. Um, I guess thanks, Sue, for the work that you did with that. It's a, it's a great piece of work. I had a question just regards to the RAP app. Is uh, Through your discussions, with, is there an opportunity that we could 
receive feedback for any illegal dump site that is reported through that app that perhaps that we could then engage that piece early on because i think getting feedback on um on what's going on is is really important as we work on these other pieces but perhaps that's something that we could uh, accelerate yeah, if there's some um, opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I think I think if you pull together the coalition, um, and I know um, Simone and I forget who the guy is in Lillooet that I interviewed, both, both of them were uh, keen to address uh, uh, illegal dumping. They do what they can, but they also noted being a bit thin on the ground in terms of also having to deal with, you know, bear incidents and poaching and, you know, a whole bunch of other things that pull them in different directions. So, um, so, and also it had sounded like the RAP head office actually had fewer staff than they had had in the past, which meant that um, I know Mary Lou had requested even just stats in terms of what had been reported in, um, what had been reported in the region. And then I had asked as part of this project, because I know like that they had shared that data in the past just for Whistler on some of the bear um, human uh, wildlife um, conflict incidents, um, but we were not able to get that data. And that was the same thing that we heard from Couch and Valley, which is why they went to their own reporting system. Right. Um, but uh, it could be because obviously lots of regions are worried about legal dumping and probably asking for the data. Um, you know, that would be something to ask at the coalition to see if at that time, if there's still those challenges. And if there are, then you might want to go with your own reporting system. Um, but if there is uh, some better system that is more easily able to share data, a bit more responsive as well, because sometimes they get reports in, but there might be so much else going on in their offices, they're not able to handle it. Um, it would be good then if it could go on to uh, the SLRD and then out to whichever other parties may be able to address it rather than just saying, well, we can't do anything about it and it's just going to stay out there, at which point it might draw more material. Right. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you, Sue. Okay, one more chance to ask a question before we move to the next subject. And I saw that there's quite a bit of interest, so I will share um the report about illegal dumping from from Equinspire to um all of you guys i don't see i don't see any more questions so we'll be moving to the next subject um so basically um i don't know if you all are aware but the original district just opened the new transfer station in pemberton on November 2nd. So November 2nd was the first day of opening. So I just wanted to provide a little bit of um, information about that. Uh, Vanessa, can you, we're just gonna share um, our screen. Basically it will be like the SRRD Pemberton Transfer Station um, website. Um, so, what happened with the Pemberton transfer station, basically in 2017, uh, we did a feasibility study and then we um, did an update in 2019 of that Pember of that feasibility study because 2017 was a little bit old. Um, and then in 2020, um, a site was selected. So basically it's a um, it was owned by the village of Pemberton. It's at the at the very back of the industrial park in Pemberton, uh, which is the only place where we can um, held a um, transfer station in the entire area. No other areas are zoned for a transfer station. Um, in 2020, we also held a survey for residents of area C and Pember village of Pemberton kind of like asking, we couldn't ask them where they wanted the transfer station. Uh, we were very, very limited with uh, like sites options, um, but we asked them like what kind of service they wanted, uh, how can we, could we improve their, their service we were currently providing. So we heard a little bit of feedback that we were able to provide to uh, residents. Um, so it's been a very, very long process. 
uh, but we were finally able to open. It is a very small site. Uh, Vanessa has a great um, new facility guide. So it's a very small site. It's um, it's less than an hectare. It's a weird shape, which made it very, very challenging for um, the um, for the layout. It, it's it's very, very challenging. It's very tight. Um, but we were able to provide something that has a scale. So now we're moving from cubic meters to tonnage. So we're able to copy or get close to Whistler Callahan tipping fees uh, for everything that is kind of like um, couches and wood and clean wood and all of that. So um, we have that. We this is the new, the big new thing at the Pemberton transfer station is the scale. Um, the transfer station is divided in two sections. The first one before the scale is um, all the recyclables. So basically everything, anything that is free. So this layout is basically what I like to call, it's a Nestor Depot and a Callahan transfer station if we compare to Whistler service area. Um, so we have all the recycling from Recycle BC. We have organics, glass. Uh, we have bottle depots like the refundable. Um, we have a reuse shed, uh, which is great. It's well used. People really like it. Um, and then in terms of, do you? Thank you, Vanessa. Um, and then in terms of like other um, in the paid area, basically we have um, garbage. We have over what we call oversized garbage. Um, so anything that is is not compacting, um, but it still goes to the landfill. And then we have clean wood, dirty wood, tires, appliances. And we have in, in number eight, um, we have a what we call rotating bin. We didn't have the space to provide um, all year round, but we have a rotating bin for mattresses, drywall, and yard waste. So basically once a month we have a different product and we have a schedule already in place so people can plan in advance. Um, so November is drywall, December will be mattresses, um, and uh, January will be yard waste. Uh, in the past, we couldn't accept uh, drywall or mattresses. So I think this will be uh, well received. Um, so people won't have to go to Callahan um, all the time. If they plan accordingly, they'll be able to use the Pemberton Transfer Station uh, for that. And I don't know, Vanessa, can we pull a picture where we can see a little bit more the um, the shipping containers that we're using? Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit right now. No, those are the shipping container for the uh, recycling. This is one thing that I'm actually very, very happy we don't have it. Okay, um, I'll try to, to find it and maybe sending it, sending it in the comments. Um, we yeah, belt shipping here, right? But I don't have a closer picture. Oh, okay. Um, so basically we belt shipping containers, um, modified shipping containers will, with roll up doors that we have bags aligned for all the recyclables and also for the reuse shed. And basically at the end of the day, they can just close the door so it avoid any littering, any like flying, plast small plastic, uh, birds getting into the recycling, um, all of that. Um, so right now, the biggest challenge for the current for the transfer station is the traffic flow. It's it's very tight, so we're working to find kind of a better flow, um, but it is. It, we're working with a very, very limited um, spy site in a very odd 
shape. But yeah, I just wanted to give you like a high, high level quick update. Um, and eventually uh, you'll be able to uh, come and have a visit. And um, one thing that I'm very, very proud of is we have uh, Lidwat Construction Enterprise as their contractor. So this is, this is great. We're really happy to work with them. Um, we have great relationship already. Workers are super keen. Um, so yeah, they're doing a really fantastic job for, um, and they pick up with the information very, very quickly, uh, which is great because day one, hour one of the opening, there was like a lineup of cars. They were like having to try to manage the scale and the payment and the traffic lights and all of that with new information. They never managed solid ways before. So all of that was all new and they just pick up with like in day one, they, they were just doing a fantastic job. So we're really, really happy with that um, partnership. So, um, so yeah, that was just uh, read it. I'll just share. I was going through my phone and then Shannon sent them to me at the same time. So here we go. Sorry, I have a lot of things open. You all see that? Yeah. So yeah, this is um what you're what we're using right now uh, for the recyclable. So it's very easy to keep it clean. It's very easy for people to understand where it's, when it's dark, as soon as you get close to the shipping containers, it light up. So, um, so yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty great. I think it's, uh, it's something that I'll want to use like in many of our facilities at the regional district. It's so much easier to keep everything clean at the end of the day. Uh, as we know, it's quite windy in the area. Thank you, Vanessa, for <laughs> getting that picture up. I kind of put you on the, st on, on the spot. Sorry about that. Mary Lou, where is the transfer station being transferred to? So basically the transfer station is still in, in the same area, still in the industrial park. It's just two streets down. Um, by the um, Pemberton Brewery. Same street as the Pemberton Brewery. And at the end of the street, just beside the transfer station, there's now a, how do we call it, Vanessa? Um, um, the new nursery, is that what you're trying to? Yeah, exactly, yeah, the nursery. I also have a map up on the screen right now with the old location and then where the new location is. But where's it going after the new location? Where are you shipping it to? Oh, we start going to Callahan Transfer Station. So yeah, all the ways going to Callahan uh, recyclables are going to um, Squamish GFL uh, Recycling Depot. Um, Yes, Tom. Uh, isn't um, there's a recycling uh, depot in the in the industrial park? Yes. Yeah, so we have the we take, have bottle take depot. Them to Sorry. Yeah, we have the bottle depot um, in Corp. Is that it? It's only bottles. No, it's uh, they takes electronics recyclables uh, from Recycle VC. Um, okay. Yeah, you have a pretty good service. Okay, why not take take your recyclables to there? Is it, are you are you getting a better better relationship with the one in, in Squamish or? Uh, we have just too much. Uh, we have like, we have a compactor for uh, mixed plastic. We have a compactor for uh, cardboard. Um, 
just like the first two weeks of operation, we didn't have the 40 yard bin every three days. Yeah. So the amount, like, I don't think that the bottle depot would be able to um, kind of like handle it. Right, okay. LC, however, they do bring the refundable to the bottle depot. Okay, yeah. that's what we do as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. and then we have um, for the foam and plastic bags and all the wrap, uh, we have we have bins, and we just pile all the all the bags in there. Um, and when it's full, we ask GFL to service it trying to make the most of it and not having it serviced too often. But yeah, we have a 30 yard bin for white star foam and then smaller bins for um, plastic bags and overwrap and uh, colored star foam. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, I see, yes, Andrew, I will share. Uh, information on those are uh, recycling containers for sure. Um, we share the specs because they have to be modified and um, kind of like engineered for snow load uh, capacity and all of that. But yeah, I can I can share those specs for sure. Thank you. And I can share it with uh, like Shannon if you're interested, Tom if you're interested, the one that have like more like transfer station. Um, recycling depot operations. Um, Sorry, one more question. Are you within those uh, shipping containers for recyclables, are you using mega bags? Um, not currently. What we have is those um, just clear plastic bags and they are on, um, it's kind of a metal rack that you just put the plastic bags and then when they're full, um, they tied it up. Oh. We have we have a mega bag at the back just to help the the staff, and then when that's full, they just um, move it to the containers. Okay. What we call what I call storage containers. Yeah. 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 Thanks. But yeah, you're uh, you're more than welcome to um, to have a tour. Well, I was there on the opening day. I did take a look. <laughs> it's good. Oh, did I? S yeah, I saw you, but I, you were busy talking to people. So. Oh, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't notice you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. It was a beautiful ceremony. Was um, it was. It was really beautiful. Um, I'll, I'll let Vanessa take some time, but uh, we can. Uh, can just share a picture at some point during this meeting. It was a really a beautiful, uh, beautiful ceremony. Um, they did the bear dance and the bear song, and the bear came out from at the back of the transfer station, just saying, like just a peek. Um, so that was cute. But I'm being sidetracked right now. So, um, so let's take five minutes break. And then we'll come back and we'll uh, jump back to um, the agenda and uh, the rest of the meeting, which will be mainly solid waste management plan update and the um, discussion that we'll have at the end. So uh, I would say five minutes, so 2.47.
Okay. It is 2.48. So if you guys could turn on your camera so I know you're back in the meeting and I don't start the meeting too early. Thank you so much. And so we know who's missing. Just waiting for a few more, so I'm just going to wait a minute. Okay. We're still waiting for four people. So, um, just let me know when you're ready, Mahu, and I'll stop sharing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I can see that Sue is back with us. Um, okay, so we're start, so we're not being too late. A little bit behind schedule, but I've tried to make it um, quick. So the next um, the next items on our agenda is the solid waste regional uh, and re sorry the Solid Waste Resource and Management Plan. Uh, I think we're the only regional district calling it a resource management plan. So it's a little bit confusing at times. Um, so basically we wanna provide you with an update um, and get review and comments uh, from you guys. So Vanessa, can you share uh, the slide? Thank you. Um, so we provided a little bit of a uh, different information from um, the previous one. So we finally received updated information from the province in regards of the 2020 um, data. So the province is now at 499 kilos per person and the regional district um, all elected electoral areas plus member municipalities, we're at 489 kilos per person. Um, it's hard to say for sure why it's a little bit higher than we used to. Um, obviously COVID, we didn't have like as high as a population. Uh, people kind of stopped traveling and they stopped coming in our area, like they didn't come as, a, as much in our area. And, the, and so we had like a lot of development going on. So lots of construction and demolition. Um, but we'll, we'll try to keep track and see how we can reduce, keep reducing that um, kilos per person. Next slide. So this is where we're at. Um, so as you can see, the province has slightly decreased and we we increased. So again, we'll have to do more um, research on that to see what happened, um, but I'm not too, too concerned at this point. Um, I'll be able to get more data for, um, for 2022 uh, very soon. So next slide. 
uh okay so what we decided to do this uh this time as part of the presentation was more to focus on what we've done this year in 2022 and what we're hoping to accomplish in 2023. Um, just a reminder, the solid waste management plan, so we work on the focus amendment. Now we'll be going to a solid waste management plan full update. So the idea is to start in 2023 with a review of this current solid waste management plan and start in 2024, the process of a full update. So we'll talk about that uh, more next year. Um, but just to let you know, if you have any um, information that you will like to add, this will be next year, we'll start that process and 2024 to 2026, we'll really be focusing on that update of the solid waste management plan. So, <clears throat> So in 2022, as we talked about during this presentation, uh, this meeting, we worked on the illegal dumping strategy and action plan. Uh, we relocate the Pemberton transfer station. We are currently working on the waste room technical guidelines. Basically, Squamish and Whistler, they have a guideline um, already in place. The regional district been using what they have, tweaking it to um, to make it so like regional district appropriate. But we're hoping by by the end of this year, by the end of 2022, we now have a proper guideline for any development. Um, up to this year, we didn't have that many development going on in our like elected electoral areas, but for sure it's coming like Britannia Beach and Fur Creek. Um, there's many projects coming in. So this is really a, a need for us and it's something that we didn't have. So we're pretty happy. Hopefully by end of 2022, it will be done. Um, another thing was the Squamish landfill focus amendment. So Shannon talked about that uh, quite a bit. And we also updated Goldrich transfer station bylaw, which was well needed. The previous one was dated from 2005. So we increased a little bit the tipping fees, uh, but not too, too much. Uh, so we don't want to create more illegal dumping. Um, but that one is, is done. And the Pemberton transfer station bylaw uh, was also updated. Next year, uh, what we'll be working on is the Recycled BC Remediation Plan for Britannia Beach and Furry Creek. This is specifically for curbside collection. Uh, so I'm, I started in 2022, but we'll have the plan adopted in 2023, and uh, we'll have to take uh, actions uh, to reduce contamination in our curbside totes. Um, solid waste emergency management plan, it's something that I was hoping to do in 2022 and um, didn't have the capacity to work on this, but I am still hoping that we'll be able to tackle that in 2023. And it's basically to kind of like gather information of in case of an emergency, where will our waste go and how we'll be able to handle all the waste. Um, let's say if we didn't have access to the Lillooet landfill or if we couldn't use, uh, if people around Divine couldn't use a Divine transfer station, where where could we, could we use a land to kind of like set up those new transfer station? Could we have, um, pre-agreement with other landfill to ship our waste, uh, kind of like kind of a roadmap in case of emergency. A um, few bylaws that I want to update as well. The Little at Landfill bylaw is in need to be updated. Uh, and then the Britannia Beach and Fury Creek Service bylaw. We also want to create an ICIN multifamily bylaw. The waste room guideline basically will ask developers to create a waste room for to make sure that they have all the streams available for their residents. So basically all the recyclables, the organics, and the garbage. The 
ICI and multifamily bylaw, my hope is to be able to enforce the P like those strata to provide the service. Um, right now, there's nothing at the regional district level that can force a strata to provide garbage recycling and organics. So it's something that I want to work on. I'm not sure, not 100% sure how it's going to work at the regional district level, but um, we'll start that early in 2023. And then, as I mentioned, the solid waste and resource management plan for review and update that will start in uh, 2023. Next slide. So <clears throat> instead of presenting every single actions, this time we decided to focus on what we still need to work on. And um, while sometimes, like as you can see, the District of Squamish and, uh, the, and Whistler have been making great progress, um, the regional district is sometimes behind a little bit. So, um, so the ICI and multifamily communication strategy, uh, starting with the bylaw and trying to kind of like really um, enforce um, the need to recycle and divert more on that level. So uh, the regional district needs to do quite a bit. We've done some progress in a sense that like um, signage uh, has been, it's been on our website and available for ICI and multifamily. Um, for quite a bit. Um, I think the goal is to for Vanessa to keep working on that and tweak what needs to be tweaked, that needs to be changed. But um, at least Brooke at the time did a great job at providing all those um, signage and being available. Uh, we probably need to do a little bit more um, communication around that, like to remind people that it, it is available and it's it's a great tool to use um to divert a little bit more and then tourism accommodation communication strategy um there's still progress to be done on that um as well as construction and demolition communication strategy so the district of, of squamish and western have been doing quite a lot on the construction and demolition side um the regional district hasn't done much around that and this will be part of the uh, further discussion at after this presentation so we can like spend more time talking about that because we heard from um folks in this committee that it was something important um next slide uh so again promote local construction demolition waste that was something in our management plan that we haven't been able to uh, work on yet, but <clears throat> hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to uh, start working on that next year. As rebuild it center in Pemberton and Lillooet, for sure it's a it's a need. Um, there's need for greater conversation around that. I don't think the regional district is the only um, stakeholders and player to make it happen. Um, very often we need organization to be able to take that on um, or we need land to be able to hold to have that. It's, it's, it's not an easy one. It's not something that is kind of like as easy as uh, we could we could think of. Um, but for sure I see the need. Uh, I would like to make it happen. Um, but yeah, there's um, <clears throat> there's for more information. And um, Shannon just uh, posted something. Uh, Squamish uh, rebuild is actually in need of um, someone to take over. And um, so yeah, they need a new leadership. So hopefully someone can take that on and we don't lose that in Squamish. That would be a big loss. Um, Funding for local zero waste initiatives. Uh, it's something that uh, Vanessa is working on. She's been making progress. It's not ready yet, uh, but her goal is to really be able to provide funding to more um, zero waste initiatives. So we just need to 
um, let people know that those exist. Um, at the regional district, it's sometimes our biggest challenge is to reach out to people to let them know that they can come to us and ask us for either funding or help or any kind of support. Um, it's a little bit it's a little bit harder to uh, get the response that we would like. Um, hey, Mary Lou, just to that point. What sort of funding would you be looking to provide? Is it do do you have an understanding of amounts, or are you looking at um, just partnerships on government funding? Like, how would that look like? So we have we we have a couple of grants in our budget to help um, fund those initiatives, and it could be like an organization. Um, trying to organize an event that will be zero waste or promoting zero waste and will be helping them by i don't know supporting like paying um the rent uh paying um or giving a little bit of funding for um for help me out here vanessa i'm losing my word and this is really your project <laughs> Yeah, I think it would be, so we're working, working on the framework right now. Um, what I'm thinking about is I've been doing some research and Sunshine Coast has a really nice program um, that might, we might be able to shape a program that it would be similar so that uh, nonprofit organizations could um, submit a proposal for a, a project or an event that they would like support for. Um, and I think the amounts would be smaller they wouldn't be um i think you said government grants or something they wouldn't be that amount but we're talking about small um amounts here and there to help organizations have waste separation events okay great thank you your hands up shannon yeah we're actually meeting i've got a meeting set up for sometime in the next couple of weeks we're looking at doing something similar in squamish so maybe we should work together Let's connect because we um, we're very similar. We're looking at zero waste slash circular economy. It doesn't have to be a nonprofit. I think we're landing on it can be. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly the curriculum or sorry criteria, but uh, yeah, let's feel free to loop me in. Just let's connect. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I I I feel like somehow the south of the regional district is a little bit better organized and. That's like, we're really trying to work at something like that will be like, would be providing the same level of service and supports to the north of the regional district. And that's where we have a little bit more challenge, uh, but we definitely wanna make sure that we, any type of programs and funding we have is fair and shared between um, from electoral area D to electoral area A. Um, so that's kind of a, the main goal. Um, we're making progress on the landfill bans on specific uh, APR materials. So every time we update a bylaw, we uh, ban some type of materials. In some areas, we need to be a little bit um, strategic uh, because we don't always have um, like the recyclables or the programs that we can provide to divert certain materials. So we need to be, we need to be a little bit more strategic in terms of landfill bans uh, because we can, we can just not accept some materials at the landfill, but not provide other options. So <clears throat> for example, in Lillouette, we don't have the mattresses recycling programs and the mattress are going to the landfill. And at this point, that's the only, the only option we have. So I couldn't be able to ban mattresses from the landfill until I'm able to provide a sustainable mattresses recycling program. So that's kind of like where we stand at the regional district. Um, do you have another question, Shannon or? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, next slide. Uh, curbside recycling and yard waste collection in Lillouette. That's for sure. It's um, 
it needs in, like communication with the district of Lillooet. The district of Lillooet is in charge of the curbside collection. Uh, right now they're providing curbside collection for garbage only. Um, as well for the recycling curbside, it's something that will need greater conversation uh, with Recycle BC, but also how we'll be handling that material if we were to do curbside. Right now, the recycling area in Lillouette is set up in a way um, that people bring their recycling and we build separately. If we were to have totes coming in, like we're not set up like squamishes. So that will be a little bit more challenging and will require, I'm sure, quite a bit of changes. So it's not something that I see that will be uh, feasible in the near future. Um, and it will need to have greater conversation with Recycle BC anyway. Um, as for yard waste, I haven't been in communication with the District of Lillooet in terms of yard waste. We have a great program right now um, at the landfill. I know it's a little bit, it can be challenging for people to bring it to um, to the landfill, but for now I haven't received any comments um, from resident or I, or from the district of Lillooet asking for that. So it's something that will be rolled to the new um, solid waste management plan if we still think that it's a, it's a need and it's a priority that we should focus on. Recycling waste minimizations, uh, minimization at events. Um, we do require um, some sort of solid waste management plan at events, but it's mainly uh, events that are greater than 200, I believe. And um, one of the challenges, we are not always aware. So we just need to, work a little bit better at the regional district and get like a proper forms uh, that everyone needs to uh, fill out with a proper um, a proper plan on their waste management. So we have something uh, and just need a little bit of improvement. Uh, require new developments to design for tree streams waste management. So we talked about that. So that's what we called um, waste uh, waste room guideline. Um, and we're close to have something uh, completed um, for hopefully end of year. And then the expansion of Squamish landfill. Uh, this is going to be like, um, it is a multi years project. So um, first step like it's Shannon is all over it so um, we're just going to keep working all together on that <clears throat> next slide um so establishing a working group with the responsibility of evaluating residual residual waste management options um still need to make a little bit more progress on that in a sense that um my hope is to be able to meet um two to three times a year which we haven't um but uh we're working on that and hopefully it's going to be become a little bit like the pmac meeting um we used to have i don't know it wasn't very frequent frequent uh and now it's like we're really good at meeting three times a year so uh i'm sure we're going to be we're going to be well we're going to be well organized for next year um, illegal dumping strategy. So we have we have the strategy right now. We just need to work on the actions that Sue um, presented, um, <clears throat> and that's going to be like a multi years, and it's going to be ongoing. So um, uh, require commercial, and then the next one require commercial collection containers to be animal proof on electoral areas. This one, um, I haven't been working too much on it. We have uh, this. We had discussion about that, especially with the Wild Save BC coordinator um, at the SRD. Uh, we haven't made much progress on that. It's a little bit 
uh, we need to make sure that we're able to provide um, the collection, um, especially that we're not like in the electoral areas. So, <clears throat> so we haven't done much progress on that and we'll need to do some way more research uh, to make sure that we, all the pieces can are aligned and can work together. So uh, for example, I'm thinking just the district of Lidouette, if we require them to have um, and more proof containers, but they can provide the service for those containers to be collected. Like we need to make sure that it it works at all levels. Um, and basically, um, yeah. And we don't have that many commercial collection in electoral areas. Um, most of our electoral areas are residential or very very small uh, businesses. Um, and I'll need to get a better understanding of uh, all commercial that we have on our electoral areas. So yeah, I haven't done much progress on this one. Uh, Sue, yes, you have a question. Uh, no, just more a comment. I mean, they don't have to necessarily be, you know, commercial animal proof containers. They can be chained closed. And as long as they have a proper closing mechanism, most of the containers are functional. So, I mean, there's ways of approaching this and getting to the point where at least they're required to be chained closed or in a, or in a facility, like in a, surrounded by a fence or whatever, mm -hmm. to minimize access. So. There are some strategies that could help in the short term. Yeah, yeah. I like to be honest. At this point, I have no good understanding of the amount of commercial that we have within the electoral areas. Um, so that will that will be my first step, basically, to understand a little bit what kind of businesses we have, and um, what kind of uh, containers they have and what kind of ways they have. Um, so that will be my first step of like a greater understanding of what's happening in our elected electoral areas. But you're right, it doesn't have to be that complicated and it can be, uh, can be quite like small and still effective. Uh, next slide. Vanessa, Vanessa, are you there? <laughs> oh, I think Vanessa. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. <laughs> well, so that's the end. So obviously there's a lot to be done um, at the regional district. Um, we're making progress, but there's still a lot. Um, there's still a lot to work to work on, and um, so yeah, I, I'm sorry I haven't been doing that many that much progress, but um, a little bit at a time. Yes, Sue. Um, is there any update on things like um, the creation of the wood chips and the compost? Like what's happening um, across the regional district on those kinds of things? Um, so for wood chip and well compost, we have the little wetland, like basically the only compost program we have at the regional district, it's at the little wetland field. So that's basically the only one. Uh, in Gold Ridge, we do accept, um, it's not yard waste, it's uh, wood waste as part of the Fire Smart program. Um, but we do organize burn at the end of the year. So it's not being composted. Um, in electoral area D, so in Britannia Beach and Fury Creek, we have um, basically six months of the year, we have um, bins that are being sent to uh, to Sky or to Squamish and then C2 Sky to be composted. So we have that as a program. Uh, and then Pemberton, um, it goes to C2 Sky Soil, but we don't have, um, like basically all the organics are being 
um, people need to bring their organics to the transfer station. And then we'll be uh, bringing the yard waste bin um, every three months at the Pemberton transfer station. And in Divine area, there's there's nothing. Uh, we did try to provide a yard what yard waste program, but it didn't um, it didn't get much attention. So, is there any intention then to like continue? I mean, okay, I'm proposing there should be something um, included in the planning so that we expand on both composting and wood waste management. Burning wood is not a good solution in terms of climate change. So it should not be the go-to. Um, so I would certainly want to see it um, added as a line item and given the attention it's needed so that that waste gets used in the highest and best possible way. Yeah, and that for sure can be brought to the new the new plan, I think this like back in 2014, uh, when we started to work on the on the plan that we have right now, uh, wood waste was certainly not a priority, I will assume that it, it is now. So uh, it's for sure something that we'll be able to add on. Um, at this point, there's always, it's always very hard for like smaller areas to come up with those bigger programs just with the cost. And it's unfortunate that it always comes down to a cost at some point. Um, basically Goldbridge wouldn't have the capacity to have like a proper wood composting program. It will have to be brought to Lillooet landfill. So, but it's something that we can, we could look into uh, we'll just need to be uh, kind of like looking a little bit how 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 it will look like and uh, do we have the capacity and can we send do we have the capacity to receive it in Lillooet and um, do we have the capacity to uh, to send it from Goldbridge? But it's for sure something that will we can add to the next plan. And I, I'm always I'm always trying to bring up more diversion options for uh, the electoral areas or those smaller transfer station. Um, and sometimes I I I I try to focus on uh, the thing that I don't have um, I don't have anything uh, like recycling in Goldbridge. Uh, we were able to improve the recycling programs over the years, which is great. Um, there's more and more diversion now in Goldbridge, which is, which is awesome. Uh, we've been able to manage the tires in Goldbridge. Uh, basically, Goldbridge has been accumulating tires for the last 10 years. And this year, for the first time, we were able to work with Tire Stewardship Program and get them shipped and being re properly recycled. Uh, so, uh, and that was for me like a really big item because for me, that was a huge risk for the environment. I was always scared of a wildfire and um, and getting those, like, I don't know. I was always scared of like having like a tire, like a fire with all those tires. Like when I'm talking tires, I'm talking like almost 2000 tires on site. So um, I haven't been able to move those was a big, big win. And um while it seems to be like a quick fix for smaller, um, for areas that are a little bit closer to town, uh, it took me two years to get those tires moved from Goldridge. So, so it's a big win. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it, but for me, it was a big win this year. Uh, so, yeah. Anything? Anything else? Hey, Mary Lou, just a, I guess, a comment. Um, where does uh, advocating for change fit into this? So, you know, we've been we've been providing feedback to the province, to EPR when they're when they're um, engaged to receive that information. But just on an ongoing basis as a group, uh, what's how can we do a better job of advocating for change so that 
you know, a lot of us that deal with waste all the time don't feel like we're continually drinking from the fire hose, so to speak. We need to have changes um, at a, a different level than where we're at and, and how do we move ahead and do that in a coordinated way. I agree. Um, I don't think there's any items on the current plan about that. And that's basically it. Like the presentation here, it's more like, hey, this is all the actions that we still need to make progress on. And this is from the 2016 Solid Waste Management Plan. And it, it doesn't say that anything else is not important and all those issues that we have right now are not important. It's just like, hey, those are the actions that we said we'll be committing and those are where we were lacking. Um, but we do need, I agree, Andrew, we do need like a more advocacy ab about those challenges. So we all speak together. Uh, Denise, you have something? Yeah, I just want to agree with Andrew. And I think that we should have advocacy on our agenda because I think that that's something important we can do. And, and to note, when you put up the, uh, the where we're at as a province on uh, diversion, et cetera, and waste, we're doing really well. We're in like the top third and we're like 499 kgs per person, which is still more than the 370, is it, that we committed to doing five years ago? Yeah, so we're years. not doing it and we're way better than everybody else. And so I think we do need to get the province or somebody on, on board and, you know, to actually be sort of supporting some of these things. Like, again, some of the things that I see in the industry, we, we and when, when I say GFL, I don't know what the other divisions do. I know in this district, we try to do everything right as far as diversion and, you know, accounting and recording and all that. But I certainly see lots of stuff that isn't being done right. Uh, and where's the, who stops that? Like, you know, like, I, you know, and again, we have a competitor new in Squamish and I'm watching what they're doing and it's, it's criminal. Who stops that, right? So for me to compete against it or any other garbage company, so it's a race to the bottom. And I think it's like that throughout the whole province. So I think the only thing we can probably do is ask for stronger, what, legislation, uh, you know, some sort of fallback to, to sort of help protect us. And so I think advocacy needs to be on this, uh, our agenda. I agree, Andrew. Um, Sue, thank you, Denise. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think I think advocacy is a really key part. I think uh, on this committee, we should be paying attention. Um, and now I'm gonna put my zero waste BC hat on. Um, uh, that the province, the province is committed to develop a circular economy strategy. And this is something that came up with um, a whole lot of uh, local governments asking in 2017 at UBCM for a zero waste strategy. And then in 2021, asking for a circular economy strategy. And this year, the province put it in their budget. And they keep on saying, okay, yeah, we're going to be uh, rolling out the, the engagement in the fall. I think what they're doing is actually engaging with um, uh, First Nations first. And um, it's too bad uh, Lucinda couldn't make it today because she would probably have more insight into that. But um, so we should be expecting that the province will be asking uh, what a circular economy strategy should look like. Uh, Zero Waste BC, we've had some uh, sessions with local governments and uh, elected leaders and staff, as well as indigenous community leaders and um, environmental groups to try to get people starting to think about, oh, this, yeah, this would be really good to have in a circular economy strategy. And so we're hoping to meet with um, the ministry once we have our brief ready. And then once we do that, then we could share that more broadly. The other thing that we do sometimes is because there are so many consultations uh, for the EPR programs and then provincial and federal ones are our, our, our first primary focus. Um, we have been bringing together groups of people who are interested. And I know that Shannon's been uh, part of some of them where for the EPR programs, we will um, uh, have a meeting, have people try to say, oh, these are the different aspects that we want in, um, in the revised plan, and then have uh, basically sort of an open source document that people can take uh, and tailor it to their organization, uh, 
change the pe take the pieces in and out based on what they want so that more of us are advocating for similar things because we saw in 2011 when um, the province tried to raise the deposit rates on EP uh, on the beverage containers industry came out really strongly against it and there was only one or two local governments paying attention and so nothing happened and so we see that change can happen more when all of us are um, uh, advocating for that and also lately you know the province and federal governments have been having more consultations than they have in the past 15 years. <laughs> so there's definitely, like Andrew says, a lot of drinking through the fire hose, but a lot of opportunity to make change. So um, if anybody wants to be part of the email list when we do some of those like group engagements, um, feel free to contact me, but I think engagement would be a key part. Yeah. For the... It was for the Recycle BC consultation that's out right now that Sue posted. I even paid for an ad in our paper <laughs> to be like, hey, people, you got problems with our recycling? Participate in this consultation. <laughs> um, I mean, Recycle BC is not doing it. So, I mean, it sucks that I have to pay for it. But yeah, my vote for advocacy is in. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Shannon. Did you? Oh. Hey, Laurie, I can't, I can't hear you. I don't know if it's only me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry, I just wanted to echo um, Andrew. Thank you so much for bringing that up. And uh, Denise, policy absolutely needs to come into it. And um, I've thought a few times, Andrew, about the zero hierarchy waste triangle during this conversation about four times. And the number one thing is rethink. It's not reuse and it's not what all of us do. It's rethink and there needs to be more onus on the consumer. And Mary Lou, you are making an impact and you are moving the dial. It takes special people to deal with waste and we're all doing it, but I do think there needs to be more onus on the consumer through advocacy and policy. I just want to reiterate, thanks for bringing that up, Andrew. Yeah, what about, what about like, do we want to create a working group like that will meet about advocacy and consultation? Um, do we want to organize that? I'd be more than happy so we can have a working group and it's not as formal as the PMAC uh, with like being recorded and like, but it's like all of us together are the one that can and are interested and we work on those kind of thing. Like the challenge I see sometimes with consultation is the lack of time they allowed us, they gave us. And sometimes when we need to bring information to the board, it's just like, Hey, we can't. We just meet. We just miss miss the board. By the time we have new consultation, uh, we we can bring it to the next board meeting. So that's for me is one of the big challenge. If I need to get like more power from the from the regional district board, um, but I'd I'll be more than happy to uh, create kind of like um, a working group, and uh, we can start with an email to the PMAC committee members and ask for uh, the one who are interested. Okay, I have that, I have that on the list. Uh, just give me, uh, Vanessa, do you, do you need to go? Sorry, there's a... Sorry, I had to run away earlier because childcare called me. Um, no, I think they said they'll call me if it becomes an emergency. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Challenge with kids. Um, okay. Any other comments or requests or like ideas to, uh, move that ahead? Perfect. Uh, we will, okay. So moving forward. So what we did, we have only half an hour, but we'll try to, um, I'll ask you what you guys um, prefer. Just let me bring, um, just need to bring the agenda up. So um, 
Okay, so what we decided to do this year is for the last part of the of the meeting is kind of ask you guys what you would like to discuss. Uh, what would be your priority? And Vanessa kind of gathered all that information and I will let her speak to that because it was quite broad, I believe. Sorry, I'm working with two mics. Um, yes, and it was quite broad. We did get a lot of feedback. Um, I know that there are all priorities and I don't think that we were trying to dismiss that. We know that they're all important. Um, but we wanted to be able to narrow it down so that we can have a more focused discussion because as amazing as this group is, sometimes we kind of go out on tangents and we just wanted to focus and kind of see if we can come up with an actual structured uh, discussion together. Um, so we decided, and I guess we'll see how long and how involved people get into this, but we had chosen two topics. ICI multifamily communication strategy. And then the other one that people were really interested in was the promote local construction and demolition or waste reuse recycling. Okay. So um, in terms of ICI and multifamily uh, communication strategy, um, the reason, like there's always a need for that. Uh, we all know. Um, but also because the original district is quite behind um, District of Squamish and Whistler on those two piece. Um, so I wanted to kind of like discuss a little bit like how, first of all, how can the regional district support better the ICI and Mercy family uh, diversion? Um, and then like, because that's always the way, like how can we support you better? And then on the side, we can, try to work on and make progress on uh, for our electoral areas and um, some member of municipalities that we we work with. Um, so basically it's kind of like open table. Um, do you feel you need support on those? Do you feel it should be a priority? Uh, I know it is for the regional district on some parts because we're we're not there yet. We don't have a bylaw yet asking people, asking Strata, ICI, and multifamily to do it. So we we really need that. Um, but how can we better support you guys uh, on those on that topic? Or if you feel that you're okay, um, you don't you don't need that much support, or it, it's not like. I wouldn't say it's not a challenge anymore. I think it's a quite a bit big of a challenge, but um, yes, Shannon. Um, I know it's tough uh, on how to allocate like efforts on this, especially when you look at like this is Big Squamish having a bylaw in place already, but I would say we can always use support and communication. There were some, there was some great signage done by the SLRD in like, I don't know, 2016, I wanna say. Um, and it still lives on your website and we kind of direct folks to it. Um, but it, I think like putting a little bit of time and effort into that and like we have a guide for ICI and multifamily homes and property managers, but kind of I, I really enjoy having uh, regional co consistent messaging and signage across the whole region. So um, whatever that looks like, that that's kind of where I would put my effort, recognizing that We've already got the bylaws, so I understand it's a little bit more difficult in some places. Yeah, agree. And this is something that we can we can for sure do um, support communication. And um, Vanessa will be looking at the signage. I know Brooke did a fantastic job with that. Um, I think we just need to kind of bring a little bit more attention to uh, the signs that are available for um, for Stratas, for ICI and multifamily. Yes, Laurie. Um, Claire Ruddy, I know you were going to step away, but I think of your garbage room experiment that AWARE did for multifamilies and may, can you speak to it at all? Do you have any preliminary data or any sort of real success you can take away? Um, we have sorry to put you on the spot. 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's all good. So we have data from the from like I think we did six months from that going in. I think we tracked for a period of time after. So I have like the final report for that for the period that we tracked. Like we're not we're not still in there tracking. Um, so we definitely we we focused on a before and after in terms of the data. So we've got that. Totally happy to share it. And then um, you know, like all that signage stuff that happened in 2016, that was a big collaborative piece. Um, but I think we're still all kind of, you know, utilizing and all that stuff. that garbage room was all in line with decisions that were made way back when then. Um so yeah, like we that's that's the garbage rooms. And we've got, you know, we have all of the stuff to do that. It's actually We've just been talking and planning for 2023 and we're talking about how do we do some more of that based on the outcomes and of, of that trial. Um, notably, the piece that didn't work because this question posed by Laurie was the piece about having a bin for the reuse it center in there. It just got so abused, um, which was a shame. Um, but for everything else, it, it, it improved things. Thank you. Yeah, that would be fantastic if you can share uh, that report and we can probably kind of like use some of that information and create some communication around that. And now I'm, I I understand that I'm putting just more work on Vanessa's plate. <laughs> Easy for me to say that. Uh, yes, Denise. So a couple things, um, following up on Claire's waste room, uh, we did uh, a similar one, a copycat room in Squamish, uh, the GFL sponsored in the senior center, the new senior center. And then we, uh, but we didn't call it a waste room, we called it a diversion room. And we're actually, so first of all, we put colors up around the wall and then we put words up around the wall. And then we've gone there and we've started a diversion committee uh, and then we've done educating with the whole, um, you know, the population, but then the, specifically the diversion committee. So what they did, if, if you have a diversion committee, then they go to the waste room every day. I think they have, I don't know, seven or eight people on their committee. So they'll take a different, each one will take a different time during a different day on Monday or Tuesday, that kind of thing. And then they'll be in the waste room at some point on my Monday and help people and say, no, put it here, put it here. So the recycle reuse it center stuff, and we also helped with like cork boards and a sorting table and a bunch of things just to make it like a, a great place to be. Uh, and so, and then they're taking the reuse it things, um, you know, that, you know, put it in this place, whatever that is, and they're taking it, the diversion committee, if this is my day, at the end of my day, I'm gonna take these things, and not, you know, so it's not too much work for anybody. Um, and I think language matters. Like I think calling them waste rooms now is so 2001. I think we have to call it something different. So I'm calling it diversion committee or uh, diversion rooms. And I think it's just, I mean, I think, we, I think we have to just start kind of changing the lexicon a little bit so people know what the purpose is. On that, we've also started, um, not, I mean, specifically for multi found, well, I guess we've been starting doing some uh, waste composition assessments. So again, uh, if somebody calls and says, how can I do better? We will come and we'll look through their garbage and say, you know, this shouldn't be here. You've got all of this in the air and this whole bin is filled with cardboard or that kind of thing, uh, which is, I mean, of course it's slow work and we're trying to add it into what we're doing, but that is, sort of helping to make a difference, I think. And it's kind of like what we're doing on the curbside in Squamish is we're doing the, the tote audits where the guy actually goes and looks in your tote and sees what's there and says, no, don't do this, don't do that, and that shouldn't be here. So we're doing that same thing in the multifamily dwelling rooms. And I that's it, that is changing behaviors a little bit. And the other thing we're doing is diversion reports. And I personally think that this should be something that the municipalities require um, because, and, and maybe the province requires, so we know where you're at with diversion and they know where they're at. So what we're doing is, and again, we're doing it slowly. So when somebody asks us a question about something, we'll do a diversion report and then we'll maybe do a waste composition assessment. 
and then we'll do blah, blah, blah. And so they'll see, okay, right now I'm at 23% diversion. Right now I'm at 64% diversion. Right now I'm at 82% diversion. It means nothing to anybody unless we, you know, the global we, I guess the, and I, I'm guessing that's municipalities and SLRD, set something that says where, we're sh where we should be. And I, and, and, and I don't know that we've done that. I think Shannon's working on it with the, and Sue are working on it with the zero waste committee and such. But I think we need to decide, okay, what is, like with our curbside, we're at 56%, is that where we wanna be? Or should we be at 72%? Uh, you know, with our multifamily dwelling, if, if I say to somebody, right now I'm saying, here's what you are, you're 36%. And then I can't qualify that with, well, you're below, you're below average or you're above average or you're where you should be or, you know, but I think we need to get to that point where we're actually saying, you know, this is where you're at and this is how you fit in the scheme of things. And this is where you need to get to. I mean, right, right now we're doing it for, out of kindness and just, you know, to help people who want to focus, focus. But the bigger problem is the people who ask us are usually 60, 70% diversion. It's the people who aren't asking that are the issue. They're the ones that are sort of just sort of throwing everything away. Um, Denise, can I ask a question? Does that mean that you not you you guys now are able to isolate the weight coming out of a particular strata complex? So when you no, we we make a, uh, so if you have a whole ton of glass, the weight of that typically is X <coughs> numbers. If you have a full tote of organics. The weight of that is why, and that's what we use. So, so we've actually, what we did is two years ago, we created these self-diversion reports that, you know, you could take your own bill and kind of go over it and figure out where you're at. We sent it around to everybody. We did it with the Chamber of Commerce, both Worcester and Squamish. No one cared. No one cared. You know, nobody wanted it. We say, diversion. We say, well, here you go. Here's this report. You can do it yourself. No one was interested. Now, if we say, hey, can, can I get you this diversion report? Or I got a diversion report for your, you want to see it? Oh, sure. But it's just interest. It doesn't kind of mean anything. But I think, I think we have to start getting there at some point so that we can say, hey, where are we going, folks? Good for you or not good for you. And kind of, again, I had talked a few years ago, I think about having like a five leaf program or a, you know sort of saying that I'm a one on that or I'm a three on that or I think we need to I think consumers care I think that if we, they had a way of identifying who was doing a better job that would mean something uh, but I'm just putting that out to you and um, yeah oh and on the way and the on the uh, gar on the garbage rooms on the diversion room coloring program I actually brought in century signs and I said okay because we painted that one we actually went in there and hand painted but I said, is there a vinyl product or something we could put on the walls to make this uh, something that people could have if they wanted without being a lot of labor intense? And they said, yes, I got some pricing for that. So my hope is at some point I can say to people, if you want your room to look like this, you know, this is what we can do. And we could probably put it on their bills. You know, so I think, I mean, I think that is the first step, Claire, in making it a place that people want to be. That's it. I won't keep talking. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Denise. This is all, um, all great, uh, all great information, really. And uh, you're right, like having a target will kind of like get a little bit of information for people to kind of like understand where they stand. Um, so I'm looking at chat and I'll get back to you, Sue, uh, in a minute. Uh, Shannon is asking, should like a working room for a working group for emergency management and debris management for the region, advocacy and residual options. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send an email to all of you guys uh, about the different program, like working group. And um, we're gonna start on that and, and see if we need, like I don't wanna create too many groups because we don't have time. That's the kind of the challenge but I don't wanna force some of the members to assist to some of those meetings about something that they don't wanna, they don't wanna be part of. So we're gonna create a few different groups. We already have a residual option group, Shannon. It just hasn't been that alive. 
uh, Vanessa has or will be sending an email very, very soon. Uh, we were just working on availability on my end. Um, but uh, so we're going to get that. So at least we're going to have some groups um, starting. Um, my question is right now, before uh, I'm going to your questions, to our comments, is it's 348. Um, do we do we want to still talk about the ICI multifamily or we want to jump into uh, construction and demolition debris? Knowing that we have only kind of like 10, 10, 10 11 minutes last to the meeting. It can be our topic next time if we don't discuss it this time. Don't speak all at the same time, guys. <laughs> I'd like to talk about the construction debris. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, Sue, do you want to add your comments before we go to the next topic? I'm going to throw them in the chat so we can speed along. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you. Okay, so next topic, uh, construction demolition debris. Uh, as mentioned, the regional district hasn't made, made progress on that, but again, uh, I'm sure we can better support you with what you already have in place um, until we, uh, on our end, make more progress on that. So again, my question is, how can we better support you? Um, a working group on that topic would probably be um, very interesting to make sure that we kind of like work all together towards the same goal. So I'm opening the floor again. How can we all work together. How can I, can the regional district support you on, on that? Yes, Sue. So for me, this ties right back to the centers for Pemberton and Lillooet because we need, in order to divert off demolition and construction waste, we need somewhere that people can access it. So these things are, are really closely related. And I was wondering as well about, and I don't know what's available. I once upon a time used to be able to scavenge at the dump, which was great. And of course you can't do that anymore. But you know, a lot of construction ends up with two by four waste and things that could very easily be recycled. I live on a farm. I actually go go to places and say, hey, I'll take that piece of siding because I can make an animal shelter with that, right? Um, there's certainly ways of diverting this stuff. Um, we need the opportunity to do it. So. Like on my end, um, like let's say for the South. So Pemberton Transfer Station is really not the place, uh, unfortunately. So that will be kind of like on Andrew to see what he can do. Uh, we take only like small materials, like we, like it's even like now to, it's smaller than a 12 foot trailer that we can accept at the transfer station. We're not set up for big loads. We're not set up for construction, uh, like real construction companies, um, but it's something that we could actually look for uh, in Lillouet. But again, that's um, like for the center, if someone has a great idea or knows a great organization that would love to take that on and that we could support, um, it would be fantastic. Um, we've been really trying, like Vanessa, I've been like trying to make contact in Lillouette, trying to find ways, even for the reuse, we don't call it a free store anymore. We call it a reuse shed. Um, even for the reuse shed, we're trying to have people taking on the, that work because um, having that at the landfill, it be creates more issues. But for the construction demolition, I'm like, there's probably some progress that we could make. Um, we just need organization that would love to take that on and kind of raise their hands and be like, hey, I'm interested. How can we make it happen? Um, I, my question would be, isn't there a way to put the onus back on construction companies to start sorting and making this stuff available when they're doing demolition and when they're doing these construction jobs? Like if, if you know, 
grocery stores and everybody else has to start taking on their recycling. Why don't construction companies have to start being part of the solution and start providing those options either at their own facilities or at the construction site or wherever it needs to be? Like, it doesn't necessarily always have to be brought into a central location. So, you know, that to me is a solution that could come through policy or even best practices and be promoted and whatever. But it, there's, there's got to be a way of doing this that doesn't involve, you know, tons of extra money or space. So that's well, amazing. And I will let Squamish, uh, Shannon speak to that because they made really great uh, progress on that. Um, so I will, and she has her hands up, raised. So. Uh, I feel like you're setting me up for <laughs> not success on that. I, I don't have, uh, I was just going to mention a few things that we're working on. Um, so we typically have a no um, scavenging policy at our landfill transfer station. Um, but I am working on, aka haven't started yet, but have been researching, uh, creating a salvaging program for construction wood and bike tires, I think is where we're going to land because the tire stewardship program is not really taking our bike tires and we have like a mountain. So I'm like, maybe, maybe somebody wants some of them. So it's complicated. I was actually at the landfill this morning chatting to folks there, like um, our site supervisor, how it could work logistically. Uh, and then I have to run it through a legal review and get a waiver. So it's quite complicated and I'm going to launch it as a pilot in all reality, it'll probably be early 2023 by the time it gets out the door. Um, but uh, that's one thing I'm doing. And then um, pallets, <laughs> pallets are like the bane of my existence and probably Denise's at this point in time. <laughs> um, anyway, I've been, I was at a conference recently and I found out that in Vancouver, which isn't appropriate to like Lillooet probably at all, but there's a lot of folks who collect pallets for free and then they reuse them. So I kind of started sussing that out and I've made contact with somebody at Ocean Legacy and they're keen on coming to Squamish and taking pallets for free. Um, and so I am, while we could do that at the landfill, we really just don't have space to store pallets, to be honest, even they're like, okay, minimum we can pick up is 50. So I'm actually, it's on my list to do is like pay Home Depot and Rona visit in person and like try and plead that they make up some space and and then we can kind of support them in that project. Um, Shannon, so yeah. what, what companies do here, there's a number of places in town where they just post a sign. They're literally left outside of the building with a sign on them that says free pallets. And it, they're hard to come by here. Everybody takes wow. pallets. We don't have that problem. We have the opposite problem. We see a ton of pallets come in through people. People would rather like businesses, construction sites, whatever. We see them bring loads and loads of pallets to the transfer station in Squamish as, and they pay, they pay dirty wood rate for it. So they drop it off. And then, and then GFL is responsible as per their contract to, to dispose of that properly, which used to be chipping it and sending it or not chipping it sending it to port melon for um hog fuel that's not happening right now so yeah it's we have a little bit opposite or maybe it's just people want convenience and get rid of it right away um but yeah we've got lots and lots of pallets coming to us as wood waste right now so anyway that's a bit of a squamish random update i'm not sure denise if you're doing anything else on this uh, no, actually, to your point, Shannon, we are having um, trouble moving uh, wood waste right now, and we are uh, we it was going to you know can for and it and it's not at the moment, so it it is a bit of a struggle presently. So we're trying to find other places, um, you know, for landscaping or livestock or or other places, but we haven't found one that will take large volumes. So that's actually uh, an issue that's coming down the pipe. Actually, it's like all. That that is the problem with recycling, right? All things with diversion, the markets come up and go down based on who needs the what. To help GFL, I don't know if Denise even knows this, but I even had a call with like a mushroom farmer to see if they would take our wood waste. No, they'll take wood waste if you have hard woods, not construction waste. 
Has anyone ever posted an ad on Facebook in the marketplace to say free pallets, come and get them? So uh, the, the pallets, when they come to Squamish, when the transfer station, they're, we, they're treated as like recycling diversion. So we're not, right now, nobody's allowed to take anything. So yes, people put them on the side of the road in Squamish, but not everybody. And so there's a lot that are still making their way to this giant pile that Denise is, we're, tr we're trying to figure out what to do. And the regional district, we don't do that. It's not our, like, we just don't. However, like I did encourage um, people when we were like trying to find um, kind of like a need for some of the materials, especially in Lillooet, uh, to kind of like, hey, spread the word. So we'll be using like more like just the contractors that's spreading the word. And we found like use for like some of the chipping materials uh, because we do chip in, in, in Lillooet. We have that um, just a program, the composting program just for, uh, not for food waste, uh, but for wood waste. And so we're trying to find um, the one that the materials that is not great for the composting program and that we still chip, we're trying to find options. Um, and yeah, that's is just like kind of like spreading the word and like the contractors up there, they kind of like, they know each other and they, they'll, they're fun to use. Um, but yeah, I know for the little at landfill, there's still quite a bit going to the landfill that could be, um, that could probably be diverted. Uh, we just need to find where to send it. Andrew, do you have any, like, do you have anything else to add? Well, it's a challenge in Whistler as well, the C and D would. I know that, um, you know, the contractors that I have talked to do try to redirect wood uh, where they can, but we still receive a lot of that material at the transfer station. And then that, you know, is um, that is the challenge to manage it from that point on. Um, so, um, so we're looking to improve that system, and we're looking uh, holistically how we can improve the, um, you know, the construction and demolition waste um, uh, process in Whistler, so that we can capture and recover more uh, and, you know, I guess initially try to reduce that waste uh, through some of the policy changes that are coming down the pipe uh, in the future months. But it's a challenge, it's the same challenge that, uh, that everyone ha has. I think uh, trying to create space to allow for some of this to happen is important. Um, and we're looking at that as well. So it's, it's a priority for us. Uh, we know that C and D material is a large, uh, a large, large fraction of the waste that we recover each year. So uh, it's something that we're we're going to have to solve. It's a problem we're going to have to solve. So, thank you, and um, Sue Maxwell. Sure. I mean, we heard a lot about this when we were about wood waste and C and D stuff, but the wood in particular when we were doing the consultation, I think some things that might be helpful would be, and this is where I think the, the provincial circular economy strategy could be really useful. Um, King County in Washington had developed a, a kind of a, a map of services that would be needed to reuse wood, including like a finger jointing plant and a glue lamb plant and, and things like that. So it, it might be possible for the province to take a look at how much wood do we have right across the province, what skills and and things do we have in different communities, particularly those who used to rely on doing things with wood and they're not getting so much virgin wood coming through um, to see if there could be some sort of provincial support to develop a ecosystem of how do we use all these different kinds of wood that we have when you know, we're, a, we're a, a province that's well designed to be doing things with wood. Um, the other thing is stopping the flow of certain things. And so when I worked at, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, and we used to get bucket loads of pallets out the back from all the supplies, um, was uh, to start talking, and this would be something to work with the uh, companies that are getting all the pallets in, but to start talking with their suppliers to see, and some companies, deliver, like supply companies, would then shift to reusable pallets, and some of them uh, did want their pallets back 
um, anyway, because sometimes they had special palettes that were formatted to their products. So there, there might be some different ways to try to tackle it, but it, it's not going to be instant, I don't think. Thank you, Sue. This is this is great information, and um, thank you, Misha, uh, for coming. And uh, Shannon just shared that they more marked as a palette reuse program, so that's that's great. I didn't know about that. Sh no, Shannon. Oh, it's in Europe. <laughs> okay, yeah. Sorry, that's no, no, no. I'll just say it out loud. Sorry, I don't know why I wrote it. Um, I just was trying not to. Um, Walmart has an internal program. So like they have blue spray painted palettes or something. So they, and they, they're worth money to that Walmart store. So like they have an internal program. And I heard, I think there's another company, big company that has something. So it's feasible what we're talking about, like get rid of the like single use palette idea, like blows my mind. Like we can move away from that in Europe. They, when you get pallets, you also pay a huge deposit on it. And I think they might actually be like uh, harder wood and like maybe engineered wood or something like that. And then like the, it's, it's not this disposable pallet system. So I'd like us to advocate for that too. <laughs> it is 4.05. Um, any other comments before, um, so one. Yes. Does, does, do people have insight on what Sea to Sky Soil does with any construction debris, waste? Are they using it in their compost bin? I don't know, Tom, but I, under Omar, which is the regulation that composters have to comply with, there's very strict, um, direction on the use of feedstock woods. So they would have to be very careful in what they were introducing into the process if they were allowed to do that. Thanks, I was just wondering. Thanks, Andrew. Um, okay, so basically my understanding would be, let's create those working groups so we can focus on those um, specific uh, outside of the PMAC uh, meeting, and we can still work on those and work as like a group uh, to advocacy, but also find solutions um, at the more regional level and uh, help all like e each other. So um, we'll be working on the minutes. We'll be sending that to you guys, um, and I'll be starting to work on the request for decision for the board in January to um, ask for the board to um, send the amendment to the Ministry of Environment. And then we'll be uh, sending invites for uh, different working groups. And then we can work on um, um, every few months. Uh, I don't think like a, once a month will be feasible for any of us. We're way too busy for that. Uh, but maybe every three months we can have like a, a meeting around those working groups. Um, and yeah, so I thank you all very, very much and uh, wish you a very good weekend. Hopefully we have nice weather and uh, you can go all enjoy the outdoors. Thanks for all your hard work, Mary Lou and Vanessa. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to Bye. see you all. Bye.